of Who Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. And we are moments away from the Fed's latest decision on interest rates. Let's take a look at markets, stock markets, that is, ahead of the news. We do have a mixed picture here. The Dow little change very slightly to the upside, up about 11 points. The S&P down about 7 tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ, of course, taking a hit today because of the disappointment following those earnings numbers from Microsoft. Um, from Alphabet and from AMD. So uh, the Nasdaq down 1.2%. But as we await the Fed, I sort of joked with you yes. ahead of this. Do you think we're going to get a change? No, nobody thinks we're going to get a change today. But the question revolves around the language that will indicate a future change. Yeah, two things. So you're right. So obviously the markets think you're not going to get a change today. FOMC will hold uh, rates steady, unchanged here. But to your point, a couple of things. One, the policy statement. And then two, of course, all the attention on Mr. J. Powell, that presser. Any kind of signals, any kind of clues, Julie, we can get about when the Fed does make a change to its policy stance. Yeah, and again, the the presser is always important as well. But I think that there will be more attention on the statement this time than is typical, because Fed watchers really like to comb through the in, the language that's in the statement to see yeah. if there's a change from sort of more neutral um, language to that more easing bias. And we'll see if that ends up happening. You know, we were just talking about what's going on with stocks here today. Mm-hmm. Um, based on that unusual move for a Fed day to see this much movement because you have that reaction to what's going on to in reaction to the um, to the big tech earnings. If you look on the bond side, we've got some decent moves here, move downward in yields, which seems to anti- indicate, again, that anticipation that we'll get some kind of easing color from the statement and or from the commentary here today. All right, sending it on over now to Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonberger with the details. No change. The Federal Reserve maintaining its benchmark interest rate in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent, but cautioning markets that they will not cut rates until they have more confidence that inflation is moving back sustainably to their target. From the statement, quote, the committee does not expect it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward two percent. Though officials say they are still highly attentive to inflation risks and that they are moving closer to achieving price stability and maintaining employment, that those are moving into better balance. Officials completely stripped language from the statement that kept a rate hike on the table in prior statements. They also removed language qualifying the U.S. banking system as sound and resilient and also stripped out any talk of how tighter financial conditions or credit conditions could weigh on households. Now, in a nod to higher than expected expected GDP growth in the fourth quarter. Officials characterized the economy as expanding at a solid pace, though they noted that the outlook for the economy remains uncertain. This decision was unanimous. However, separately today, the Fed said that it is applying new investment restrictions to individuals holding stocks, bonds, uh, and sector funds. These new restrictions applying to more staff that have access to confidential FOMC information. Back to you. And Jen, as you were coming through that statement just then, breaking that news, any anything that surprised you, Jen? I was surprised that they were so straightforward that they came out and said, listen, we are not cutting rates until we have more confidence that inflation is moving back towards 2%. I thought they may make some changes to language that they have maintained in the statement for numerous meanings uh, going back to the middle of last year. They did not do that. So this is a clear message to the market that, hey, guys, you want us to cut in March or in May? And we may or may not be doing it. We're very data dependent and we need to have more confidence that inflation is moving sustainably back to 2 percent. And also the fact that the economy has continued to surprise to the upside, it raises the question of whether if you continue to have economic growth that outperforms, does inflation reaccelerate based on that because you have strong demand. And I think that is a question mark that the Fed is going to have to tussle with this year. All right, Jennifer, thanks for that breaking news. We're going to be checking back with you shortly. Meanwhile, over to Jared Blickery. What are you seeing in the markets, Jared, in terms of reaction and response here? 
first move in uh, risk markets is to the downside, and a lot of times we get a fake out, so it really matters what happens after 2.30 p.m. Eastern when Powell takes the lectern, the podium there. Uh, we do see the Dow, which was just barely positive. It is now underwater by 20 basis points. NASDAQ down 1.55%. Let's get a read. Let's get an intraday chart of the Dow. You can see it sunk to intraday lows here, uh, but still not a huge movement, and we're really not expecting much until we get that, uh, until we get some questions fielded later in the day. This is a NASDAQ now down 1.53%, and we want to get a check on the bond market as well. Here are two-year Treasury note futures. This moves inversely to yield, so we have this ticking down. This is an intraday chart, so not even quite to the lows of the day, which means rates went up by a couple basis points, but really nothing major just yet. Here's the 10-year, very similar to the two-year. We got a small decrease in the bond price, which means a small increase in the yield, but not that big. Sometimes you see copper futures moving, not a lot here. Gold can also move off the presser, uh, not only the uh, presser, but also the announcement itself. You can see we took a little bit of a, a turn down there. Uh, and then we can take a look at the U.S. dollar. I think the U.S. dollar strengthened a little bit. And uh, let me just get a read of that real quick. Here's the euro versus the dollar. Here the euro went down, so the dollar did strengthen uh, once again. Now, I want to check the sector action. We saw defensive sectors leading, real estate, utilities, healthcare. Those are still leading. So not much of a change. Uh, XLC, that is communication services, houses, alphabet. That has been the loser all day. Not a change there. Tech also taking a little bit of a, a bit of a hit, down 1.5%. But I do want to check on the regional banks. We have seen a really dark red screen here uh, intraday. We're not seeing a lot of changes here. And I didn't expect to see a lot of changes. But this is something that's going to grab a lot of attention. What's happening? happened in the New York Community Bank Corp. That is down 37 percent. Didn't move off the announcement, but there's going to be lots of questions about the safety and soundness of the regional banks here. Back to you guys. Indeed, definitely a good one to highlight there, Jared. Uh, the backdrop for this statement here today. Appreciate it. So again, the Federal Reserve coming out in a new statement, not changing interest rates, but a couple of things standing out here. Uh, the FOMC saying that risks to achieving its employment inflation goals are moving into better balance. At the same time, the committee saying it's not going to be appropriate to reduce its target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. Is this what the market wanted? Is this what it expected? Let's talk more about that. For that, we bring in John Stolfus, Managing Director and Chief Investment Strategist at Oppenheimer Asset Management, and Blurina Yurucci, T. Rowe Price Chief U.S. Economist. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, John, let's start with you here. As you said in a recent note, the Fed Fund's futures market has some rose-colored glasses on in its expectation that the Fed could still maybe cut in March. Does this change that expectation at all? Will, will it sort of reset them? Uh, well, thanks for having me on the show, Julie. Uh, I've got to say, when we look at this, uh, we're not surprised uh, at what, what the, the way the, the Fed is coming out of the FOMC meeting. Uh, we think the market, uh, I was earlier expecting something like five to six cuts in interest rates starting as early as March. Uh, we think this is likely in, into the second half of the year. If it's earlier, it'll be at the midpoint of the year because the economy remains resilient. And, and Lorena, I want to get you in here as well, get your take, one, on the statement and also what you're expecting to hear from Jay Powell at, at the presser. I thought the statement came in in line with consensus expectations in the sense that they removed from the statement language that kept the optionality of further tightening in mon monetary policy. So we know broadly that the Fed is done with a tightening cycle and the next move will be a cut. There was something unusual in the statement. It was very clear and uncaveated in terms of when the next cut will be. And they basically clarified that it will be when they get greater confidence that inflation is on a sustained path to 2%. Now, from the press conference, I would expect Powell to give us a little bit more detail on what would make them feel uh, more comfortable with a path in inflation, because the data we've received so far suggests that three-month annualized core PC is 1.5%, and it's been running around 2 or below for the last six months. And we received today a downside surprise in the ECI measure of wage inflation, which uh, is the Fed's preferred measure. So we are seeing progress uh, on inflation and wage uh, pressure. So just need to get a 
better sense from Powell what it is exactly more that they need before they're comfortable that real rates may be uh, too high and they need to come down. Lorena, um, it's funny you said we're going to want to know from Jay Powell and the presser what he's looking at, because I was going to ask you, what, they, what, what do you think that they're going to say in terms of, of what they need to, say, to see to really be convinced about the sustainability of that sub 2% path? So just to clarify and divide this into two parts. First of all, I think for the press conference and the statement, the best possible outcome for the Fed is that they don't leave the market with a great sense of certainty that a cut is coming in March, simply because we have two more inflation reports before that meeting and two more labor market reports. And we know from last year that we got those upside surprises and revisions to both inflation and employment data. We don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. We don't want to give uh, markets a false sense of certainty here because the Fed is truly data dependent. But we also know that when interest rates increase very fast, something breaks in the banking system. And so the Fed will want to hedge itself against uh, that as well. So I think they want maximum optionality. And so as neutral as possible uh, during the press conference would be an ideal outcome for Jay Powell. As it comes to what will happen in the end, I do think that we have enough progress in train on the inflation front and we'll see enough deceleration in the employment data that will probably get a cut uh, at the March meeting. But there is nothing to be gained for the FOMC and Jay Powell to signal that very strongly right now. And so, John, to bring you back in here, as Blarina said, uh, you know, the Fed data dependent between now and March. We got unemployment, we got employment reports, we got inflation reports, plenty of data still for the, the Fed to kind of make sense of here. And we're all trying to place our bets, John, on, on what the trajectory of rate cuts looks like. I'm wondering what you think, John. Is it, is it, you know, when you think the cuts come, first half, second half, and does it matter to you, John, as an investor, as a, as a market strategist on the timing of that? Well, uh, when it comes to comes to this, uh, uh, the timing of this, you know, we look at it. We think the Fed has been very clear. Jerome Powell and his Fed do not want to be remembered like Arthur Burns is uh, is remembered as failing to act against uh, inflation and letting inflation run uh, for about seven or eight years before Paul Volcker had to take draconian measures to take it back. Uh, they want to be more in the uh, 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 Ben Bernanke legacy, and as a result of that. Uh, they have been extremely, uh, we think, uh, sensitive. I've been in this business since 83, so I came in in the second term of Paul Volcker. So I remember when rates were a lot higher than they are today and inflation was running a lot hotter. Uh, they don't want to go back to there. And I think the the market never trusts the Fed. And it and, and especially at the at when when you look at, at the the trading floors and the trading rooms, uh, what they trade on is very different than what uh, intermediate to long term money managers uh, like myself are going to be looking at. Uh, what we look at is we don't think the Fed thus far has not pushed the economy into a recession, even as it has raised rates for almost two years. It was only aggressive when it raised four times, 75 bips at a time. So what it, and then it's it, it's been on long pauses, uh, with the exception, I think, of one uh, 50 or one and, and 125 bips uh, hike somewhere along the way in there. But uh, the point is, the, this Fed wants to have its cake and eat it too. And so far, almost two years into the Fed funds hike cycle. It has, and I think uh, when when Jerome Powell speaks today with the press, the message will probably remain the same. Uh, essentially, there may be a few tweaks in words, but it does remain data dependent, and that's a good thing we believe for the market. We're in an environment where bond buyers now uh, get something in return in the form of a coupon, and bond issuers have to pay for the privilege of borrowing money. Great for intermediate to longer term investors, for short term investors, especially those who are, uh, uh, depend on extreme mar uh, margin or uh, uh, leverage. Uh, and it's a tough environment and they'll protest very hard. And, and John, expand on what this means for the equity market as well. Particularly, you know, I'm looking here at a day when we're seeing the NASDAQ, which has been leading stocks, of course, higher because of the Magnificent Seven is falling because two of the seven and one of the, I don't know, seven plus AMD, I guess you could call it, is, is dragging things down. So 
What does that imply about the importance of the Fed or not importance of the Fed as we go forward? I think, you know, it, it, it's it, it, in this case, it's, it's tech has had a phenomenal run. A lot of things were priced in. Uh, the, the responses here in technology results uh, have been uh, uh, somewhat uh, harsh on disappointment and rather unrewarding on positive surprises overall. And yet the results uh, are, are not so bad. And we can't, we can't, uh, on a quarter to quarter basis, you're bound to have some disappointments. It's quite natural, it's part of the nature of business. But for traders, the bet is always on, on quarter to quarter performance or even shorter than that as, as a rule. And uh, so it creates volatility. We think for uh, intermediate to long-term investors, an opportunity on, on pullbacks to look for the babies that get thrown out with the bathwater, the good stocks that are suddenly uh, priced more attractively because they get sold off in any kind of a haircut. It doesn't have to be a, a correction, but just in haircuts, sometimes specific stocks get hit particularly uh, too hard. Uh, and for traders, it's an opportunity to trade. Uh, you know, uh, they can they can play the game. Blarina, I want to get you out of here on this, just as our, our uh, resident economist on the panel here. Blarina, you know, I, I just get your take on some of the headlines we got today. Blarina, you saw the ADP print that came in light. Uh, these headlines, Blarina, we saw on, on New York Community Bank Corp. Um, those causing you any kind of concerns about your outlook for the U.S. economy for 2024, or, or are, you still stick, are you sticking with a kind of soft landing uh, scenario here? I do think we have a deceleration in the labor market. Uh, slack is being created pretty fast, first through uh, fewer vacancies, but we're also seeing the uh, pace of job creation slow down sig significantly, the base of job creation narrow, and we're seeing some headlines of layoffs as well. So I think the Fed will start to become much more attentive to the full employment side of its mandate uh, now that inflation is coming closer to target. So I do expect deceleration. That ADP number, I think that's been underperforming the payroll data for some time. There is a divergence between the two surveys and probably reality is somewhere in between. But I'm not seeing yet the, the base of layoffs being so widely spread that it gives me concerns about a recession at this point. And a Fed that is attentive to its full employment mandate and is preemptive in its rate cuts as inflation comes down, I think that just adds to the odds of the economy doing well this year. All right, Blarina, John, thank you both so much for helping us kick off the big show today. We appreciate it. All right, thank you. And now here to continue the conversation around the Fed's path for monetary policy, we have Robert Kaplan, former president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Robert, it is good to see you. Maybe we'll just start here, Robert. Your reaction uh, to the statement, what'd you make of it? Uh, they want to leave their options open. Um, I think they want to make sure that the market doesn't believe too strongly that they're going to cut in March. And... Um, and I think they're setting the stage for making a decision in either March or May that they will do their first cut. But they're giving themselves more time to see a couple of more inflation reports and make sure inflation progress is sustained. Robert, I, I have to ask since we have you here, do you miss it? You know, how, how hard it is, is it in that room coming to a consensus, not just on the decision, but kind of the discussion around it. You know, what do you, what do you think people maybe don't understand about this whole process? The Fed is a little bit like a super tanker, meaning you don't, unless it's crisis, you, you, uh, you deliberate, you try to telegraph the way you're thinking about things, and then you act. Uh, and so, for the Fed to stop raising rates, that's a little bit like moving a super tanker. To start cutting rates, it wants to be confident. Uh, and I would want to be confident that inflation progress that's been hard earned has been sustained. But once it starts cutting, it may wind up cutting more than people mm -hmm. think. But changing direction, uh, think of a super tanker, it, it takes a little bit of time to change direction. 
And Robert, uh, sticking with inflation there, you know, does the Fed wants to obviously get back to that 2% target and then importantly, right, stay there. We've had some economists come on the show, Robert, who say, you know, that actually might be tougher than, than some are estimating. What do you think? Listen, deglobalization uh, raises costs. The energy transition is expensive. And the big thing I'd point out that isn't being discussed enough while monetary policy is very restrictive, fiscal policy is historically stimulative. The Inflation Reduction Act projects, Infrastructure Act projects, the unspent spent ARPA money, American Rescue Act. And so the demand around the country from these projects for good services, but particularly workers, is having, I believe, a real impact on the service sector and why you see service and sector inflation somewhat sticky. And it's the reason the economy is this resilient. It's a mistake uh, to think that it's just a, an organic miracle that the economy is weathering these rate increases. I think without these big stimulative fiscal programs, we would have slowed dramatically further. And I don't think the Fed would have raised rates even to five and a quarter, five and a half. But that complicates the assessment uh, and it means for me that service sector inflation is liable to remain somewhat sticky. And is that, do you believe, what the Fed means when it says it needs greater confidence that we're going to see that sustainable rate below 2%? I mean, what, do, what are they looking at there? What are they talking about? I, I think if you didn't have the very large fiscal stimulus, I would have a little more confidence that the cooling we're seeing will sustain. I still do, we, we're clearly cooling, but when you have uh, multi-billion dollar projects being initiated around the country, you, you ought to be on guard and I would be on guard and I am on guard that you could see some stickiness or reacceleration. You also have the situation in the Middle East, which is snarling up supply lines and costs there. So. That's a little bit, I think, what they're watching. I, I think the predominant view is that we're seeing progress. They just want to see after this long fight, they just want to see a couple of more months of continued progress. And, 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 and on the flip side, I don't think they want to see the real Fed funds rate get much above, say, one and three quarters to two. Right now, if inflation, let's say, is running three, and the Fed funds rate is five and a quarter, five and a half. Probably all things being equal, I'd prefer the Fed funds rate to be closer to four and a half or four and three quarters. And I think that's where they're they're heading. And, and Robert, while I have you here, I also love to get your, your kind of your check on the American labor market. Because it was interesting, Robert, we had that ADP print today that was light, but it, that kind of comes on top, Robert, of what feels like almost a, a kind of daily deluge at this point of corporate announcements of layoffs from you know different kind of sectors and industries. What, what is your take on, on the labor market right now and where you think we're headed? So the good sector is probably disinflating and is weaker. Anything interest rate sensitive is being affected. If you're a business, you're sensitive to keeping inventory uh, because rates are high. Having said that, you've seen the government spending share of GDP is significant. And again, these new projects for infrastructure, battery plants, other projects that are being initiated by or facilitated by the government, that increases demand for workers. So while certain companies are laying off, I can tell you as I travel around the country, when the new project is being announced in a city or a town, it, it, it creates, it's like a boulder being dropped in a pond. It affects the entire labor market there. That counterforce is why, despite the layoffs, you're seeing resiliency in the labor market. So put it all together for us. Do you think there will be six cuts this year, four cuts? I mean, you mentioned that once they start, it might go further than people thought. So what are you projecting? But my own sense is, uh, as a business person, I don't think it's that important whether it's four or five or six or the exact timing. The sense that's very important, as I see, is that rates aren't going up. They're going to go down. Uh, I think there's a lot of confidence, and I have a lot of confidence that two years from now, the Fed funds rate will be around three, three and a quarter. Um, my guess is for this year, 
The Fed will start a little later than people might hope, but it may wind up doing more certainly than the dot plot of December, which said three uh, uh, rate drops. I think they'll start a little later than March, maybe in May, but my guess is they'll do more than three and it may be three, four or five. And finally, another sort of insidey question, if you'll indulge us. Um, we got sure. a presidential election this year. And of course, the Fed does not want to be seen as favoring one scenario over the other. So how does how does that feed into everything? So having been there during two elections now, uh, 16 and 20, uh, I mean, what you try to do is think the right, what is the right thing to do for the economy? You screen out political considerations uh, or political influence. I think you. I think the one thing you would do is, as you approach the election, I think I'd be careful not to want to make unnecessary moves or abrupt moves. But I think setting that aside, I think the Fed will try to play it uh, straight uh, without regard to what's going on in the political situation. Robert Kaplan, really great insight. Um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great to talk with you. Well, stocks are sliding after the Fed's decision to hold interest rates steady. Here with how investors should factor this into their portfolios, both on the equity and fixed income side, we have Brian Rayling, Wells Fargo Investment Institute, head of global fixed income strategy. So as we are watching the reaction here, Brian, um, A, what's your read of the statement? And B, what do you think of the market reaction? Yeah, I mean, statement was pretty much as expected. Um, I mean, you know, leaving the options open uh, made the most sense. You know, the market as a whole, you know, we were at all time highs or near all time highs in, in most markets. So, you know, just seeing a bring a little edge off there, especially as we have, um, you know, the, the bank in New York that is struggling, you know, people are a little cautious about that. And some of the earnings reports and pay perhaps not as um, robust as expected. So, you know, I don't see anything here derailing the overall market momentum, but, you know, to take the edge off a little bit for a few days, you know, makes sense. Yeah, interesting, Brian. You know, I, I know you see downside risk for the equity market, you know, kind of given that outlook, where, where do you want to be positioned? Yeah. So, I mean, we're playing up in quality. So we're, and, and more defensive for now, large caps uh, over smalls, et cetera. Um, you know, I do think that we are likely at some point um, to get a bit of a pullback, and that may be a, a better entry point uh, for investors to get a little bit more aggressive. I, I don't think uh, we'd likely see a, um, you know, a big correction, uh, but, you know, be able to get, you know, five, six, seven percent uh, lower prices. You know, I think that's probably an opportunity investors will have at some point over the next month or two. You know, of course, we're in the midst of earnings season as well. And even, you know, with the Fed not changing rates here uh, to the up or to the downside, we're still feeling the sort of trickle through effects of these higher rates on um, companies, on markets overall. Where are you looking for sort of signs of tightness or stress in the system right now? Is it in earnings? Well, yeah, I mean, I think we'll have to see earnings uh, estimates uh, come down over time. Um, you know, the 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 Fed rates, you know, there's a policy lag there. So we're still seeing that some of that lag uh, come through. Uh, you are starting to see a little bit of weakness, of course, in, in labor markets and elsewhere, but nothing uh, too extreme. You know, um, you know, an event could change that. You know, I, I would say conditions are ripe for an event to, you know, cause more volatility in markets. But I, I, I wouldn't go around predicting that event actually happening. So I think we have to stay on our toes here. Uh, it's going to be really hard, I think, to push markets, you know, up another five plus percent unless the earnings side starts uh, coming through, uh, at least over the near term. And Brian, when you say, you know, you think it's wise for investors right here to kind of focus on on quality names. How, how do you define that, Brian? Yeah. So, I mean, on the fixed income side, of course, uh, that's easy to, to qualify because it's just higher credit ratings. Uh, if you want to invest in higher yielding, you know, move up to the higher higher credit quality within that area. Um, on the uh, on the equity side, again, you know, favoring large caps over you know some of the riskier areas, uh, more volatile areas uh, such as small caps, uh, and um, again, uh, playing a little bit more uh, just defensively uh, for now. 
uh, again, waiting for a better opportunity to perhaps uh, put maybe some of those funds that are in fixed income, perhaps short-term fixed income, where you get a nice yield for hanging out, uh, putting those back to work. Brian, when you hear um, the Fed talking about it being data dependent again, <laughs> uh, what, what's going to be your big data point that you're looking at in 2024 that the Fed might be watching out for? Or are you going to sort of pay more attention to the jobs numbers, for example, than you have in the last year? Is, your, is that changing at all for you? I don't think it's changing. I mean, obviously, it's inflation uh, at the end of the day. Now, what goes into inflation? Uh, we've had a uh, extremely robust uh, economy here in the U.S., especially compared to what we've seen uh, globally uh, driven by, you know, labor. For the most part, people have jobs. Um, yes, perhaps there's not as many. Uh, perhaps it's, uh, you don't get the huge raises you used to get uh, when moving to a new job. But, you know, people are still confident in their jobs enough to spend and that's what uh, consumers here in the U.S. like to do. They like to spend as long as they're comfortable, they have jobs. So, you know, I think that's uh, the that's really the key to watch. I think people can continue to lever up to some extent um, as long as they're comfortable that uh, they're going to continue to be employed. If there's some type of event that changes that, you know, then, you know, we would see, you know, market expectations adjust quickly. But for now, there's nothing uh, really uh, on the radar screen, uh, at least imminently. On the radar, though, as you look out for 2024, Brian, I'm just curious, you know, what, what kind of concerns you, um, what worries you? Is it the Fed or the economy, geopolitics, the election? Yeah, I'm not really worried about the Fed. Um, I think it's very clear they're, they're done hiking. The next move will be a cut. When and how many, I don't think it matters that much. Um, you know, I am... Uh, you know, there's some concern over geopolitics. You know, th that those those concerns tend to be temporary when they happen. They tend not to be a very kind of long dated. Uh, but again, that's something uh, that uh, would be a concern. And, um, you know, I mean, if we would have some reemergence of kind of the regional banking uh, concerns, that would be a concern. Anything that's going to impact kind of liquidity and going to impact um you know, people's confidence. But, uh, you know, like I said, there's there's nothing on the radar today. You know, I think we need to watch the, the regional banks a little bit here. Uh, but outside of that, you know, it, something will likely emerge. <laughs> now, whether it merges this year or next or at what point, uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, like I said, it's going to be really hard, I think, for equity markets to move materially higher from here unless we start to see uh, kind of um, earnings start to pick up again. We'll be watching for all of that, Brian. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Appreciate Thanks. your time today. Thanks. Of course, we are we are waiting. Fed Chair Jay Powell, and there he is, approaching the podium and starting his press conference. Let's listen in. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. The economy has made good progress toward our dual mandate objectives. Inflation has eased from its highs without a significant increase in unemployment. That's very good news. But inflation is still too high. Ongoing progress in bringing it down is not assured. And the path forward is uncertain. I want to assure the American people that we are fully committed to returning inflation to our 2% goal. Restoring price stability is essential to achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Over the past two years, we have significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. Our strong actions have moved our policy rate well into restrictive territory, and we've been seeing the effects on economic activity <clears throat> and inflation. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. I will have more to say about monetary policy about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a solid pace. GDP growth in the fourth quarter of last year came in at 3.3%. For 2023 as a whole, GDP expanded at 3.1 percent, bolstered by strong consumer demand as well as improving supply conditions. Activity in the housing sector was subdued over the past year, 
largely reflecting high mortgage rates. High interest rates also appear to have been weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 165,000 jobs per month, a pace that is well below that seen a year ago, but still strong. The unemployment rate remains low at 3.7 percent. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers. The labor force participation rate has moved up on balance over the past year, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years, and <clears throat> immigration has returned to pre-pandemic levels. Nominal wage growth has been easing and job vacancies have declined. Although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation has eased <clears throat> notably over the past year, but remains above our longer run goal of 2%. Total PCE prices rose 2.6% over the 12 months ending in December. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.9%. The lower inflation readings over the second half of last year are welcome, but we will need to see continuing evidence to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. Longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. <clears throat> the Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We're highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. <clears throat> Over the past two years, we have raised our policy rate by five and a quarter percentage points, and we've decreased our securities holdings by more than $1.3 trillion. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle, and that if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economy has surprised forecasters in many ways since the pandemic, and ongoing progress toward our 2% inflation objective is not assured. The economic outlook is uncertain, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for longer, if appropriate. As labor market tightness has eased and progress on inflation has continued, the risks to achieving our employment and inflation goals are moving into better balance. We know that reducing policy restraint too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2 percent. At the same time, reducing policy restraint too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. In considering any adjustments to the target range for the federal funds rate, the committee will carefully assess the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. The committee does not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range until it has gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2 percent. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keeping longer run, longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to our questions. Gina. Gina
from the New York Times. Thanks for taking our questions. Obviously, in the statement and just in your uh, remarks there, you note that you don't want to cut interest rates without greater confidence that inflation is coming, coming down fully. I wonder, what do you need to see at this point to gain that confidence? And as you make those decisions, how are you weighing recent strong growth in consumer spending data against the sort of solid inflation progress you've been seeing. Sorry, say that last part again. How are, how are you weighing the growth data and consumption data, which have been surprisingly strong, against inflation data? OK. So what are we looking for to get greater confidence? Um, let me say that we have confidence. We're, we're, we're looking for greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down to 2%. Implicitly, we do have confidence and has been increasing, but we want to get greater confidence. What do we want to see? We want to see more good data. It's not that we're looking for better data. It's a, we're looking at continuation of the good data that we've been seeing. And a good example is inflation. So we have six months of good inflation data. The question really is, that six months of good inflation data, is it sending us a true signal that we are, in fact, on uh, a path uh, sustainable path down to 2% inflation? That's the question. And the answer will come from some more data that's also good data. It doesn't, it's not that the six-month data isn't, isn't low enough. It is. It's just a question of can we take that with confidence that we're moving sustainably down to 2%. That's really what we're thinking about. In terms of, of uh, growth, um, we've had strong growth. I mean, if you take a step back, we've had strong growth, very strong growth last year, going right into the fourth quarter. Um, and yet we've had a very strong labor market, and we've had inflation coming down. So I think, whereas a year ago we, we were thinking that we needed to see some softening in economic activity, that hasn't been the case. So I think we, we look at, we look at uh, stronger growth. We don't look at it as a problem. I think at this point we want to see strong growth. We want to see a strong labor market. We're not looking for a weaker labor market. We're looking for inflation to continue to, to come down as it has been coming down for the last six months. And I'm sorry, if I could just follow up very quickly. The, when, when you say that you want to make sure that it's a true signal, is there anything that you're seeing in the data that makes you doubt that it's a true signal at this stage? No, I think it's, I, I would say it, it, seems, it seems to be the likely case that, that we will achieve that confidence, but we have to achieve it, and we haven't yet. And so, uh, I, I mean, it's a good story. We have six months of good inflation, but you can, and you know this, you can look behind those numbers and you can see that a lot of it's been coming from goods inflation, for example, and goods inflation running significantly negative. It's a reasonable assumption that over time, goods inflation will flatten out, probably approximate zero. That would mean the services sectors would have to contribute more. So in other words, what we care about is the aggregate number, not so much the composition, but we, we just need to see more. That's where we are uh, as a committee. We need to see more evidence that sort of confirms what we think we're seeing, and that tells us that we are on, gives us confidence that we're on, uh, on a path to a sustainable path down to two percent inflation. Nick. Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Chair Powell, it seems to me you raised rates rapidly over the last two years for two reasons. One uh, was the risk of a wage price spiral. Two, there were risks of inflation expectations becoming unanchored. This morning's ECI report for the fourth quarter shows private sector payroll growth running at a sub-4% pace. Inflation expectations are very close to where they were before the inflation emergency of the last three years. And given that you appear to have substantially cut off these two tail risks and that you've judged uh, here today current policy is well into restrictive territory, what good reason is there to keep policy rates above 5%? Are you really going to learn more waiting six weeks versus three months from now that you have avoided those two risks? So um, as you know, um, uh, almost every participant on the committee does believe that it will be appropriate to reduce rates. And uh, for, for partly for the reasons that you say, you know, we, we feel like inflation is coming down. Uh, growth has been strong. The labor market is strong. Um, we're, what we're trying to do is identify a place where we're really confident about inflation, get it going back down to 2%, so that we can then begin uh, the process of dialing back the restrictive level. Uh, so overall, I think, I think people do believe, and as you know, the median participant wrote down three rate cuts this year. Uh, but uh, I think to get to that place where we feel comfortable starting the process, we need some confirmation that inflation is, in fact, coming down. 
sustainably to 2%. If I could ask differently, uh, if, if you hold rates high as inflation moderates, as it, as it has been, target rates will exceed the prescriptions of the Taylor rule or its variants. What would be the reasoning for holding rates higher than the levels recommended by those rules? Uh, in the current instance? Well, I, look, I think, as you know, we consult a range of Taylor rules and, and non-Taylor kind of rules. We consult them regularly. They're in our, our teal book and, and uh, uh, they're in the, all the materials that we look at. But, you know, I don't think we've ever been at a state at a place where we were where we were setting policy by them. Um, and they're depending on the rule. Uh, it will tell you different things. There are many different formulations. Another way to think about it is uh, implicitly is um, so in theory, of course, real rates go up if holding all else equal as inflation comes down. But that doesn't mean we can mechanically adjust policy as real rates, uh, sorry, as inflation comes down. It doesn't mean that at all because, for one thing, uh, we, we don't know. We, we look at more than just the Fed funds rate. We look at f broadly financial conditions. But in addition, we don't know with great confidence where the neutral rate of interest is at any given time. But that also doesn't mean that we wait around for uh, to see, uh, you know, the economy turn down because that would be too late. So we're really in a risk management mode of managing the risk, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, managing the risk that we move too soon and move too late. And I think to move, which is which is where almost everyone on the committee is, is in favor of of moving rates down this year. Uh, but the timing of that is going to be linked to our gaining confidence that inflation is on a sustainable path down to two percent. Hi, uh, thanks, Chair Bell. I'd like you to, to, to key in on the use of the word uh, in the statement that inflation still remains elevated. Um, you've pledged to cut rates before inflation reached 2 percent. So that implies that there's some sort of intermediate step here on inflation and that uh, a cut would be consequent with a change in the statement language that inflation remains elevated. What's the step down from there? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that we worked out the particular s statement language and that kind of thing. I would just say, if you look at, you look at where 12-month where, uh, inflation is, and it's, you know, it's still well above, core, core is 2.9 percent, for example, 12 months, which is way down from where it was. Very, very positive development, very fast decline. And, and you know, I th the, the, the case is likely that it will continue to come down. So, so that's, where, that's where it is. But we're, you know, we're wanting to see, you know, more data. So uh, if, if I could follow up on that, the statement um, allows that you want greater confidence on uh, inflation falling before you cut, but it doesn't mention the other side of the mandate, a slide in employment. Would a slide in employment also uh, bring you to the point of, of cutting rates? Yes. So uh, let me say that we're not looking for that. It's not something we're looking for. But it, yes, if you think about, you know, in, in the base case, uh, the economy is performing well, the labor market remains strong. If we saw an unexpected weakening in, in certainly in the labor market, that would certainly weigh on cutting sooner. Absolutely. And if we saw inflation being stickier or higher or uh, those sorts of things, would argue for moving later. Uh, in the base case, though, where, where the economy is healthy and we have, as, you know, we have ongoing growth, solid growth, we have. Uh, a strong labor market, we have inflation coming down. That's what people are writing their SEP around. And in that case, what we're saying is, based on that, we think we can and should uh, take advantage of that and, and be careful as we approach that question of when to begin to dial back restriction. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Just to circle back to um, the greater confidence aspect of the statement. Um, there's been a lot of unanimity in recent meetings. I'm just wondering, going forward, when it comes to all needing greater confidence, is the unanimity, or at least consensus among FOMC members, about what the threshold for that greater confidence is? And if not, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the discussion today on you know, what the variations between FOMC members was on what constitutes enough confidence to cut rates, and also if there was any variation on how quickly that greater confidence threshold could be reached. Thank so you. We're, we're, not, we're not really at that stage. You know, we're, 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 there was no proposal to cut rates. Uh, some people did you know, talk about their view of the rate path. I would point you to the SEP. 
uh, as as uh, you know as good evidence of where people are, although it is it is one cycle later. So, you know, we, we are we're not we're not at a place of of really working out those kinds of details because we weren't actively considering you know a, a, a moving moving the federal funds rate down. I will say there's a there is a wide disparity, a healthy disparity of views, and you see that in. Public uh, public statements in the minutes uh, and the transcripts when they're released every five years. So we do have a healthy uh, set of differences, and I think that's actually essential for making good policy. We're also able to reach agreement generally because we listen to each other, we we compromise, and even though not everybody loves what we do, they're able to, for the most part, able to join in. To me, that's a that's a well functioning public institution. Great job. Hi, Chair Powell, Rachel Siegel from the Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. So over the past few years, there have been all these real-time indicators that helped us gain a sharper understanding of where the economy was, like open table data or office attendance. You've talked about vacancies in the past. And I'm wondering, at the start of this year, what might be on that dashboard for you that's giving you the clearest picture of the economy, including on rents, if you could touch on that. Including? Rent. Uh, rent costs. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we're not, you know, it's not the pandemic, so we can actually rely on more more traditional uh, forms. People are working, they're getting wages, uh, and, and the economy is largely reopened and is broadly normalizing, as you see. So I wouldn't say we're looking at that, that sort of more innovative data as much. Um, you know, you point to rent, so of course we follow the, the components of inflation very carefully which would be goods inflation. I talked about that a little bit. You mentioned housing inflation. So the question is, when will these lower market rents find their way into measured rents as measured, measured in PCE inflation? And we think that's coming. And we know it's coming. It's just a question of when and, and how big it'll be. So but that's in, in everyone's forecast, I would say. So that will, that will help. But at the same time, we think goods inflation will probably it's been giving a lot of disinflation to the effort, and probably that declines over time. But it may well have some some more time to run. You know, these the supply chains are not perfectly back to where they were. In addition, it takes time for the, the healing process to get into prices. So there may be still a tailwind. We'll find out with with that. So we look at the things that relate to our mandate very carefully, and uh, as you would imagine. I guess just as a quick follow-up, do you feel comfortable at this point saying the economy has reached a soft landing, or is that part of looking for more confidence? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say we've achieved that, and I, I think uh, we have. We have a ways to go. Inflation is still, you know, core inflation is still well above target on a 12-month basis. 12 months is our our target. Certainly, I'm encouraged, and we're encouraged by the progress. But uh, you know, we're we're um, we're not we're not declaring victory at all at this point. We think we have a ways to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you've said that you would know the neutral rate by its works. So I'm wondering what you could tell me. How do you believe the neutral rate is working? We're telling you right now that growth is stronger. In other words, how much is the economy really being restrained right now by the current funds rate? And how much restraint does it really need additionally if inflation is still coming down? So it's, I think you, you do see in the interest sensitive parts of the economy, you do see, for example, housing, you see the effects, you do. Your, your second question though really I think is important and that is a lot of this has come through, uh, a lot of the disinflationary process has come through the healing of supply chains and also of the labor market. So you've seen that, you know, that other set of factors is really different from other cycles and has brought that working with Tighter, tighter policy, which has enabled the supply side to recover, I think is the, that mixture has been behind what has enabled this. Um, <clears throat> so no, we really do think that we're having an effect broadly across the economy. I would point to the interest sensitive uh, uh, parts of the economy as well as, as spending generally. Um, but it's a, it's a joint story. It's a complicated story. But, but how much restraint are you actually imparting to the economy, would you say, relative to the neutral rate? It's, so I think it's, it's, of course, you know that it's not something you can identify with any precision. But if, if you, a standard approach would be to take the nominal rate, 5.3 percent, let's say, and subtract a sort of a, a forward measure of inflation. If you do that, and there are many, many ways to calculate that neutral rate, but that's one I like to do. And you know, you're going to get to something that is materially above mainstream estimates of neutrality, of the neutral rate, you will. And, but 
At the same time, you look at the economy and you say this is an economy that grew 3.1 percent last year. And, and you say, what does that tell you about the neutral rate? What's happening, though, is the supply side has been recovering in the middle of this. So that, that won't go on forever. So a, a lot of the growth we're seeing is not, is, it isn't just a tug of war between, between interest rates and demand. You're getting, you know, more activity because of the of labor market healing and supply chains healing. So I, so I think the question is when that peters out, I think the, the you know the, the the restriction will show up probably more more sharply. Um, thank you. Sorry. Uh, thanks for taking the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned earlier we're not seeking a weaker labor market. I think the, the, you, you said. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Do you, do you think the labor market now is back to quote unquote normal, and that um, uh, the we can uh, achieve uh, the inflation target without wage gains coming back down to what they were pre-pandemic. Even with today's ECI levels, they were still above those pre-pandemic levels. I, I think the labor market, by many measures, is <clears throat> at or nearing normal, but not totally back to normal. And you pointed to a, a, one or more of them. So I think you know job openings are not quite back to where they were. Wages, or wage increases, rather, are not quite back to where they to where they would need to be in the longer run. I, I would look at it this way, though. Um, the, the economy is broadly normalizing, and so is the labor market. And that process will probably take some time. So wage setting is something that happens. It's, it's, it you know, probably will take a couple of years to get all the way back. And that's OK. That's OK. But we do see, you saw today's ECI reading, you know, the evidence is that, <clears throat> that wage increases are still at a healthy level, very healthy level, but they're gradually moving back to levels that would be more associated, given pr assumptions about productivity, or more typically associated with 2 percent inflation. It's, it's an ongoing process, a healthy one, and, and you know, I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. So that process can continue without a weakening of the labor market, basically, you're saying? Well, I, I think the, the labor market is, it, I, I don't know if I, it's rebalancing. Clearly, the, the, there was a uh, fairly severe imbalance between demand for workers and supply at the beginning of the pandemic. So we lost several million workers at the beginning of the pandemic from people dropping out of the labor force. And then when the economy reopened, you remember 2021, you had a severe labor shortage, and it was just, it was everywhere, the panic on the part of businesses couldn't, couldn't find people. So what's happened is uh, we expected labor, the labor uh, supply, labor market to come back quickly, and it didn't. And, we, and 2022 was a disappointing year. And you know we were kind of thinking, well, maybe we won't get it back. And then 2023, we did, as you know. So labor force participation came back strongly in 23, and so did immigration. Immigration came to a halt during the pandemic. So, and so those two forces have significantly lowered the temperature in the labor market to will is still a very strong labor market. It's still a good labor market for wages and for finding a job, but it's getting back into balance and that's what we want to see. And you know, one great way to look at that is what's happening with with wage increases. And you see it now across the the major things that we that we track. It isn't every quarter, but overall there's a clear trend still at high levels, but back down to where would be what would be consistent with with where we were before the pandemic and with two percent inflation. Chris, hi, uh, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on Rich's <laughs> question. Uh, it sounded like you suggested that uh, you're not worried about faster growth so much. So, wanted to see if you're seeing anything that suggests that inflation could reaccelerate from here. And it sounds like you're saying you're not worried that uh, solid growth from here on out poses any risk to inflation. Thank you. No, I think that that is a risk, <clears throat> the risk that inflation would, uh, would reaccelerate. I think the, the greater risk is that it, would, that it would stabilize at a level meaningfully above 2%. That's, that's to me, more likely. Of course, if, labor, if, if, uh, if um, inflation were to Surprise by moving back up, that would we, we would have to respond to that, and that would that would be a surprise at this point. But I have to tell you, that's why we keep our options open here, and why we're not you know rushing. So um, I, I think both of those are risks, but I think the more likely risk is the one that I mentioned, which is you you've had six good months, very good months, 
But what what's really going to shake out here? What, you know, where what, what will when we look back, what will we see? Will, will inflation have dipped and then come back up? Are the last six months flattered by, by factors that are that are one-off factors that won't repeat themselves? Uh, we don't think so. We don't. We, you know, we, that's not what we think. But that's the question we are asking. We have to ask, and we want to get comfort on that. And just one quick follow-up. Uh, Governor Waller had mentioned the um, uh, revisions that are coming on February 9th for the CPI data. Is that something you're watching as well? And if if we see those revisions fairly minor, uh, is that going to give you more confidence? Uh, where things are going? We'll just have to see. Yeah, we'll we look at those. <clears throat> Last year was a was a, a surprise. <laughs> Michael McKee, Bloomberg Radio and Television. Uh, if you don't want to use the term soft landing, uh, would you say at least that, uh, from your point of view now, the other scenario of a hard landing caused by the Fed is off the table or the risks have diminished uh, very much. And uh, you mentioned um, below 2 percent inflation for on a three-month basis. Core PCE has been running at 1.5 percent. And there are those on Wall Street who think that if you maintain the level of restriction you have right now, you could end up with inflation running below your target. Uh, how do you see that? So how to describe your first question, how to describe where we are. So I, I guess I would just say this. Executive summary would be that growth is solid to strong over the course of last year. Um, the labor market, 3.7 percent uh, unemployment indicates that the labor market is strong. We've had just about two years now of, of unemployment under 4 percent. That hasn't happened in 50 years. So it's a good labor market. And we've seen inflation come down. We've talked about that. So we've got six months of good inflation data and an expectation that there's more to come. So this is, this is, a, this is a good situation, let's be honest. This is, a, this is a good economy. But what's the outlook? That's looking in the review. The outlook, we do expect growth to moderate. Of course, we have expected it for some time, and it hasn't happened. But we do expect that it will uh, moderate as supply chain and labor market normalization runs its course. Um, the labor market is rebalancing, as, as I mentioned. Job creation has slowed. The base of job growth has narrowed. Um, and of course, 12-month 12 12 uh, inflation is, is above target and, and getting, you know, getting down closer to target is not guaranteed, but we do seem to be getting on track for that. So those are the risks uh, and, and questions we have to answer. But overall, this is a pretty good picture. It, it is a good picture. Um, your second question was, uh, sorry. Could you get uh, inflation that is below target, end up with inflation below target, and you have to do something about that? <clears throat> so we, the thing is, we're not looking for inflation to tap the 2 percent base once. We're looking for it to settle out over time at 2 percent. And the same thing is true. If we have a month or two of lower, and we have that now, uh, of, of inflation that's annualized at a, at a lower level, that wouldn't be good. We're not, you know, we're not looking to have inflation anchor below 2 percent. We're looking to have it anchor at 2 percent. So if we do face those circumstances, then we'll have to deal with that. I think, I think as of now, you know, the, the um, question which we want to take advantage of this situation and finish the job on inflation while keeping the labor market strong. Um, Edward Lawrence from Fox Business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for taking this. Um, so as, I, as I've heard from some district Fed presidents, is it, in your view, a little premature to think that rate cuts are right around the corner? And then when we do see that first rate cut, is that should we interpret that as the beginning of a rate cut cycle, or is it a one-off? So I'll point to that language on your first question. Yeah. I, we, we, we included that language in the statement um, to signal clearly that with strong growth, strong labor market, inflation coming down, the committee intends to move carefully as we consider when to begin to dial back uh, the restrictive stance that we have in place. So if you take that to the current context, the current context, we're going to be data dependent. We're going to be looking at this meeting by meeting. Um, based on the meeting today, I would tell you that I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting to identify March as the time to do that. But that's, that's to be seen. Um, so I wouldn't call, uh, you know, when you, say, when you ask me about in the near term, right. 
I'm hearing that as March. I would say uh, I don't think that's it's probably not the most likely case or what we would call the base case. Then your second question is on, on the is this the start of a, a when we see a cut? Is it the start of a cutting cycle or is it could it just be a one off? You know, that's going to depend on the data. The whole thing is this is going to depend on the data. We're going to be looking at the economic data as it affects the outlook and the balance of risks, and we're going to make our decisions based on that. And uh, it could wind up, you know, we'll, we'll have another SEP at the March meeting, and, and people will write down what they think. But in the end, it's really going to depend on how the economy evolves. We talked about there are risks that would cause us to go slower. For example, stronger inflation, more, more persistent inflation. There are risks that would cause us to, or if they happened, that would cause us to go faster or, and sooner, and that would be a weakening in the labor market, or for that matter, very, very persuasive lower inflation. Those are the kinds of things. So we're just, we're just going to be reacting to the data. That's, the, that's really the only way we can do this. Victoria. Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, could you talk a little bit more about productivity growth? Um, you know, you've mentioned multiple times about you know the level of wage growth that's consistent with two percent inflation. We've obviously seen uh, you know you were talking about ECI this morning, in which it's cooled a little bit, but still sort of above what you wanted to see. Growth has been very strong. How much of those numbers do you attribute to productivity, and do you see that productivity as sort of just temporary because of the factors, you, the labor and supply? Chain chain factors you were talking about, or do you think that um, productivity growth will, will fade over time? So this is a really interesting question, and I think um, my, my own view is, I think if you look, look back to the pandemic, you, you saw a, a spike in productivity as workers were laid off and, and activity didn't decline as fast, and then you saw a deep trough of productivity. And then over the last, uh, you saw high productivity last year in 23. I think we're, we're basically in the throes of getting through the pandemic economy. And the question will be, what, what is it that has changed the, you know, the productivity tends to be based on, you know, fundamental aspects of our economy. Is there, is there a case, will it be the case that we come out of this more productive, more on a sustained basis? And I don't know. I don't know. I, I, what would it take? It would take... You know, people talk about AI, but uh, I would. My guess is that we may shake out and be back where we were because I don't, I'm not sure. I see work from home doesn't seem like it's a big productivity increaser. AI, artificial intelligence, generative may, may be, but probably not in the short run. Probably maybe in the longer run. So I'm not. I'm not seeing why it would. But you know, right. You know, right now I would say we're, we're, the productivity is kind of what falls out of the the broader forces that are driving people in and out of the labor force and, and activity returning and supply chains getting fixed. Right. So would that be behind why we've seen such strong growth, but we've also seen inflation fall, that maybe there's just a higher level of productivity That's right one now. way to look at it, yeah. yeah. Nancy. Hi, Chair Powell. Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. I want to ask a little bit more about housing. Uh, I'm wondering how closely are you watching rent and housing prices as you evaluate whether and when to cut rates? And it seems like housing prices are not coming down as quickly as you expected. So when we think about, um, uh, you know, our, our statutory goals are maximum employment and price stability, and that's what we're targeting. We're not targeting housing price inflation, the cost of housing or any of those things. Those are very important things for people's lives, uh, but they're not, you know, we're, those are not the things we're targeting. We're also well aware that when we cut rates at the beginning of the pandemic, for example, the housing, housing industry was helped more than any other industry. And when we raise rates, the housing industry can be hurt because it's a very intersensitive sector. On top of that, we have longer run problems with the availability of housing. You know, we have a, a built-up set of cities, and, and, you know, people are moving further and further out. So there's, there hasn't been enough housing built. And these are, not, these are not things that we have any tools to address. But, you know, it, 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 where it comes into play very specifically in our work is inflation, which is a combination. It's, re, it's really rental inflation. You're taking owner's equivalent rent and then actual rent paid by tenants, and, and you're you're running that through the CPI uh, calculation or the PCE calculation, the one we look at. And what that's telling you is that market rents 
are increasing at a much lower rate or even being flat, and that that, that will show up in inflation over time. It has to, if, as long as that remains the case. So. And just real quick, what is your response to the letter that was sent to you by some members of Congress asking the Fed to lower interest rates to make housing more affordable? My response is what I started with, which is that our, our, our job, the job Congress has given us, is price stability and maximum employment. Price stability is absolutely essential for people's lives, most importantly, for, well, not most importantly, most, mostly for people at the lower end of the income spectrum who are living at the edges, at the margins. And so someone, for someone like that, high inflation uh, about in, the, in the necessities of life, right away you're in trouble, whereas even middle class people have some, you know, some scope to absorb higher costs. So we have to get, it's our job, it's what society has asked us to do, is to get inflation down. And the, t the tools that we use to do it are interest rates. So th that's how we think about that. Courtney. Courtney Brown from Axios. Um, can you give us some insight into whether the committee discussed the possibility of slowing balance sheet runoff in the months ahead? Yes. Um, so I would start by saying that balance sheet runoff so far has gone very well. And um, as the process has continued, you know, we're getting to that time. Uh, where questions are beginning to come into greater focus about the pace of runoff and all that. So at this meeting, we did have some discussion of the balance sheet, and we're planning to begin in-depth discussions uh, uh, of balance sheet issues at our next meeting in March. So those, those questions are all coming into scope now, and we're focusing on them. But we're, we're at the beginning of that process, I would say. Quick follow-up. Is it the case that the Fed would decide to lower rates and make adjustments to the balance sheet runoff in tandem? Yes, we do. We see those as independent tools, and so they don't. For example, if you're if you're normalizing policy, you might be reducing rates but continuing to run off the balance sheet. In both cases, that's normalization. But from a strict monetary policy standpoint, you could say we're loosening and one with tightening. So that that could happen. It's not something we're planning or thinking about. But right now, we're thinking about getting to a place where well, we're going to see the balance sheet run off to continue. We're watching it carefully and. And uh, as I said, we'll be, we'll be looking into that as a committee starting in March. Thanks. Simon. Simon Urbanovich with uh, The Economist. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Um, you've mentioned uh, six good months of inflation data, but that not being enough to build up confidence. Um, based on your previous response that your base case is you probably wouldn't start easing yet in March, uh, the implication is that eight good months might not be enough either. Roughly how many months do you think you might need of, of good inflation data to be, to be confident? Yeah, I'm, I'm not in a position to put a number on it. I'm just going to say, um, it's, and it's not that we don't have any confidence. We, we, we have growing confidence, but not to the point where we, where we feel like it's a highly consequential decision to start the process of, uh, of dialing back on restriction. And we want to get that right. And we feel like the strong economy, strong labor market, inflation coming down, it gives us the ability to do that. We think that's the best way we can serve the public because uh, ultimately we, we, we're, we've made a lot of progress on inflation. We just want to make sure that we do get the job done in a sustainable way. That's how we're thinking about it. In terms of when that'll be, you know, that, that'll all come out of our communications. Uh, and, uh, it, it, you know, we won't, we won't keep that a secret. Hi, Chair Powell. Um, Evan Reiser with M&I Market News. Um, can you uh, explain a little bit more on what you're um, considering when tapering QT? Do you need to see the overnight reverse repo facility all the way down to zero, or is it something that you can start with a couple hundred billion dollars there? Not a decision that we've made, but I, I wouldn't think we'd, we'd be, we wouldn't be taking a position that it's got to go to zero. I mean, if it, if it were to stabilize at a different level. But that's, that's not a decision that we've made. That's, that's what we'll be talking about at the March meeting. A whole range of issues uh, will be briefed up in the committee. We'll get into, get into all of the issues that, that will be arising over the course of the next, let's say, year or so. Greg. <clears throat> Thanks. Greg Rob from Market Watch. I, Chair Powell, I want to change gears a little bit. In the presidential primary campaign that's been going on for the last nine months or so, your name has come up often, and many Republican candidates have said that they probably wouldn't want to give you a third term. So I wanted to give you a 
chance to talk about that. Do you want another term you've had on the Fed? What, what's your stance on that? I don't have a stance on that. I, uh, it's not something I'm focused on. Focused on doing our jobs. We have a, we're, this year is going to be a highly consequential year for for the Fed and for monetary policy, and we're all of us very buckled down, focused on doing our jobs. Jennifer. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Powell. Jennifer Schoenberger with Yahoo Finance. As you mentioned, core PCE has been running at 1.9% over the past six months. Uh, and you guys are actually expecting core inflation higher this year at 2.4% compared to that six-month measure. Given that forecast and that the median is for three rate cuts this year, what happens if inflation stays where it's been over the last six months for the next six months? So I you know, we're going to do, we'll update our, our inflation forecasts at the next meeting. The, you referred to the December meeting. Uh, that's, that's uh, you know, three months old, so it might be lower now given the data we've gotten. So, look, we, we, as I mentioned, we're going to be reacting to the data. If, if, we get, if we get very strong inflation data and it, it kicks back up, then, it'll, then we'll go slower or later or both. If we got really good at inflation data soon, that would matter for both the, that, that would tell us that uh, that we could go sooner and perhaps go faster. So we're just going to be, t and that, but, but of course we'll weigh that with all the other factors. We're setting policy based on the totality of, of the data. Um, but just to follow, if inflation stays where it is currently, that would probably mean that the real interest rate uh, becomes more restrictive. Would that mean you'd have to trim more, perhaps, than you already have factored in? Well, I think if we if we came to the view that if that inflation were that the six month inflation numbers, which are very close to two, were in, P in PCE world, if we came to the, if that's the, if we thought that is really where we're going to be, then, then yes, our policy would be in a different place. It would. But you know, that's the whole point is we're trying to get comfortable and gain confidence that that is where, that inflation is on a sustainable path down to 2 percent or toward 2 percent. Daniel. Hi, Chair Powell. I'm Daniel Avis, Agence France Press. Um, I just wondered if I could get your uh, comment on the recent consumer confidence data. It seems to suggest that consumers are sort of moving towards uh, a much more optimistic view of the economy. I just wonder, is it fair to say uh, that they're moving towards where the Fed appears to have been in recent months? And um, you know, do you think that inflation and falling inflation perhaps has played a role in that? And what challenges do you see going forward? Thank you. Yeah, so it's been, um, it's been interesting that confidence surveys have been weak at a time when unemployment has been low, very low, historically low for a couple of years. And, but nonetheless, that's been the case. And we've asked ourselves why that is. And you know, the one obvious answer, we don't pretend to have perfect wisdom on this, is, but one obvious answer is that the price level is high. So prices went up much more than 2% per year, per year for a couple of years. And people are going to the store and they're paying much more for the basics of life than they were two years ago, three years ago, and they're not happy about it. And it's fine that inflation's coming down, but the, price, the prices they're paying are still high. So that, that is what, uh, that, that has to be some part of why people are unhappy, and they're, they're right to be unhappy. You know, this is why we need to keep price stability. It's why we need to do our jobs, is so that people don't have to deal with things like this. Um, in terms of the, it's, it, you're right. In in recent uh, recent surveys, a couple of you've seen a couple of significant increases in in consumer cap confident com confidence or or happiness with the economy. I guess that's a good thing. Um, that can that can support spending, can support economic activity. There's some evidence of that. But you're right. It is a, it is the fact that we have seen a you know meaningful increase. I think levels of confidence are still. Maybe not as high as they've been at various times, but it's they, they certainly have come up. Brian. Thank you for taking our questions. Brian Manastian and Business. Uh, committee members have said they'd like to meet with business leaders and stakeholders in person to learn more about the economy in real time, given that some data are subject to large revisions, the issue of seasonal adjustments being thrown off balance, and many readings of the economy being quarterly. So did any members say they've learned anything not yet reflected in the data, or have you yourself learned anything through anecdotal evidence that hasn't been captured in the data yet? Well, yes. I, I, I'm a big believer that yes. So we, we do meet with outside groups. Uh, who come from all different parts of the economy, and I always feel like you, um, 
I mean, I, I spent most of my life in the private sector looking at companies, individual companies, individual management teams, and then building out from that. And so starting with GDP data is, and, and working into what's actually affecting people's lives is, is, is challenging. It's very hard. So I, I really like anecdotal data. In addition, as you know, the 12 reserve banks have really the best network of anyone that in all their districts, they're talking to, you know, not just the business community, but the educational, medical, um, all, all, you know, nonprofit community. They have arms into all of that. And so when they come back, that's what goes into the beige book. But that they come back and what each Reserve Bank president does is during the outlook go around, they'll say in my district and they'll talk about a hundred conversations. They not they won't talk up. They they will give you input based on a hundred conversations that they've had with people of all different walks. And it's I I personally find it uh, very helpful in understanding uh, what's going on. And also I think you hear things before they show up in the data sometimes. Did any of them, did any of them notice slowing economy uh, based on what they've heard from like their district? Yes, I mean, if you if you look back at the, the last, not this beige book, but the one before, the, it was more. There was a lot of slower activity. I think that the, the, what you're hearing now is, is things are picking up a bit. You're hearing not not in every district, and not every every person that we talk to, but you're, you're overall, it feels like you're hearing uh, things picking up at the margin. So, that's what comes through. Let's go to Jeff Cox for the last question. Uh, thank you, sir. Jeff Cox from CNBC.com. Just kind of looking to put it all together. Um, you, you talked about basically the, the economy looking strong with 3.3 percent uh, annualized growth in the fourth quarter. Does the strength of the economy speak more loudly to you now than any inflation threat might that you know, you're in a position, in other words, to keep rates elevated as long as the economy stays strong and you're more, you're more tilted towards that? And also, perhaps, are you worried at all that the economy is maybe a little too strong right now and that inflation could come back at some point. I'm not so worried about that. Uh, you know, uh, it's, um, again, we've had inflation come down without a slow economy and without, you know, important increases in, in unemployment. And there's no reason why we should want to get in the way of that process if it's going to continue. So um, I, I am, you know, I think, I think declining inflation, continued declines in inflation, um, uh, are really the main thing we're looking at. Of course, we want the labor market to remain strong, too. We don't have a growth mandate. We've got a, a, a maximum employment mandate and, a, and a, a price stability mandate. And those are the two things we look at. Growth only matters to the extent it influences our achievement of those two, of those two mandates. Thank you very much. All right, that was Fed Chair Jerome Powell addressing the decision on the part of the Federal Reserve to keep rates steady. Um, but a lot coming out of that press conference that is worth highlighting here. And one comment in particular, sending stocks to the lows of the session. That's the comment uh, by Jay Powell that the Fed's base case is not for a cut in March here. He said, I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting to identify that March is the time to do that, meaning to cut rates. Now, he did leave the door open. He didn't take it off the table, as sometimes reporters ask him to do. Um, but he said, uh, you know, we'll look at the data. We'll see if it does, if, if something changed. But he was pressed repeatedly, Josh, to see you know, what would you need to see for the committee to have greater confidence that inflation is sustainable at this level? And he sort of didn't give those specifics. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, the bottom line, he seemed to, when I was listening to Powell there, he seemed to generally like what he was seeing in terms of the data. And when he talked about inflation, it is cooling. He has to like the shift he's seen there, but it's just not where the Fed wants it yet. And obviously, of course, the Fed wants it at 2%. And, and Powell made it clear in that presser, Julie, when he said, listen, I don't just want inflation to hit 2%. It can't just tap 2%. He said, you know, I, it needs to hit 2% and hold there. And so for now, based on what he's seeing, as they kind of make their way to that goal, 
a March cut isn't likely as these say things now. Of course, between now and March, he gets a lot more data. He gets more employment yes, data, he yes, gets more yes. inflation data, and should, but he seems skeptical right now that it happens in March. Yeah, I mean, and I should say, it's not that he didn't answer. He basically no. said, we need more. He wasn't right. specific about what they needed. It was just more good data, he said. I mean, when we talk about 2%, though, as, as some of the reporters pointed out, the core PCE has been below 2%. It's 1.5%. So, uh, you know, I guess they just need to see more of the same, perhaps. Yeah, it was interesting. He was also pressed, by the way, on the soft landing. Mm -hmm. I heard a couple questions about that. You know, are you comfortable saying you've hit that soft landing, mm -hmm. which, of course, would mean, you know, yes, you're hitting that 2% target without a downturn. He would not go there, no surprise. He simply said, listen, the, the data I've been watching, it's been good on the economy. We are, of course, expecting, you know, growth to moderate there. Yeah, I also thought it was notable. He seemed remarkably unconcerned about the labor market. Right, he was asked a few times about the labor market, and he just, he didn't seem to think that it was going to necessarily be an issue, um, yeah. at least not this year. So I, th I thought that was a, a telling detail. I, I just heard perhaps. a central banker, you know, Julie, who, who likes the trends he's seeing, but was not gonna, you know, and we didn't expect this, he's not gonna wave the victory flag. He's mm -hmm. gonna stay cautious and patient. He actually said, we're not gonna rush this, right? He wants to maintain all his options. Um, let's dig a little bit more deeply into what we're seeing in the markets here. As I mentioned, we are seeing stocks sell off here. There was still a little bit of a lingering hope, certainly reflecting the Fed Fund's futures market that March was going to be eligible for a cut. If you look at that CME watch page, Fed watch page, well, that's pretty much gone, at least for now. Our Jared Blickery has been watching all the market action like a hawk, and he's here now with an update. Hey, Jared. Thank you, Julie. I was just looking at the CME Fed watch tool on my phone, and throughout the uh, throughout what Paul was. Uh, Powell was saying, and the odds actually increased of a rate cut at one point, and that's when stocks climbed to their highs, and I can show you on this chart here, but now, after all of those headers and after Powell saying, all right, March is pretty much off the table, that has crashed, so there's only about a 30, 35% chance right now uh, of us getting a rate cut in March, although that changes, as you can tell, minute by minute, uh, so we'll have to see where that lands, but the net result is this is a risk-off day for the Fed, and oftentimes when we get this, risk off day, it continues into Thursday. So we'll be on the alert for that possibility. The Dow actually sunk into the green on the report. And let's get a look at the sector action here. We had healthcare leading earlier. Uh, it's still just barely in the green. Utilities and real estate had been in the green. They're now in the red. And uh, communication services and tech, they've been the laggards all day. Those are earning stories. Uh, but let's get a check on the NASDAQ 100. And we can see Alphabet, which has been suffering all day. That's down 6.7%. Uh, worst day in weeks, if not months, for Alphabet. Also, AMD also in focus, uh, down 1.5%. Microsoft down almost 2%. Uh, you might forget that. It was green on the open. It was up about 1, 1.5%, but no more. And then Apple has been in the spotlight recently. That's down 1.44%. And let's get a five-day view, and we can see it's been down just about all of those five days. Uh, we can also take a look at the semiconductor space. Uh, we did get those AMD earnings after the bell yesterday. We're seeing Qualcomm up 1.64%. We're going to be looking at that after the bell about 35 minutes, uh, 40 minutes from now, so stay tuned for that. And then just in terms of low quality tech, we can look at this, this disruption trade. And uh, Tesla is a mega cap, but uh, the smaller balance sheet stocks, all of those taking it on the chin as well, guys. All right, Jared, thank you for that update. Appreciate it. Moving on, the Fed keeping interest rates steady here while tempering expectations on rate cuts ahead. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonberger here with the very latest fresh off Fed Chair Jerome Powell's press conference. Jen. Good afternoon, Josh. For those hoping for a rate cut as early as March, Fed Chair Powell seemingly pouring cold water on that, saying that he probably won't have enough confidence from the data at that point to begin cutting. Take a listen. I don't think it's likely that the committee will reach a level of confidence by the time of the March meeting to identify March as the time to do that. But that's that's to be seen. Um, so I wouldn't call, uh, you know, when you say when you ask me about in the near term, right. I'm hearing that as March, I would say uh, I don't think that's it's probably not the most likely case or what we would call the base case. 
of course, the Fed believes that they have likely reached the peak on rates in the current cycle, uh, that they will begin cutting sometime this year, certainly not looking like March, though, based on what the Fed chair has just said. Uh, but he says the economy has continued to surprise to the upside, and so it remains to be seen whether they're going to continue to see progress toward that goal. He says to feel more confident that inflation is moving sustainably back towards 2 percent, it's not that he needs to see better data. He just needs to see more data, right? We've had six months of inflation around 1.9 percent as measured by their favorite inflation gauge, PCE. He's going to need to see more months of that data to feel confident to begin cutting. Now, when they do begin cutting, he said it could be a one-off cut or it could be the beginning of a rate cutting cycle. It's just going to depend on the data. He said, Powell said they're not ready to declare victory quite yet and th that we are definitely going to get a soft landing. It's going to remain contingent on the data, of course. Now, when it comes to the balance sheet, uh, Powell said that they're going to begin formal discussions on that at the March meeting. They haven't quite broached that at this time. Guys. Jennifer Schomburger, thank you so much for bringing us all that. A uh, little bit of surprising press conference when all was said and done. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Joining us now with more reaction to the Fed and to the press conference is Lukash uh, Tamiki, LRT Capital Management founder and managing partner. Uh, Lukash, thank you for joining us. So, you know, Jay Powell being um, pretty firm there, leaving the door open, but being relatively firm that March is not when we're going to get a cut. What do you make of, of that statement from the press conference? Good afternoon and thanks for having me. I think the Fed really, really wants to cut rates and they want to cut as soon as they possibly can. And to me, this sounds like desperate talk of trying to look strong and puff up their chest, how they feel very confident they're going to deliver on inflation for the American people. But I think the reality is they have real estate and private equity friends of theirs calling them five times a day, but, begging for lower rates. Lukash, what it what is that based on though? What for, for how, what are you drawing that conclusion from? Because that's not what we what the words that were said in the press conference today indicated. And if they wanted to cut rates, why aren't they cutting rates? He set a very low bar for cutting interest rates. More of the same data for a few more months. And we have to remember that the Fed works primarily from market expectations, not just what happens to the Fed funds rate. Since October, the long, the long part of the yield curve has come in by 100 basis points, and we've had incredible tightening in bond spreads. So there's already loosening financial conditions that are feeding through to the economy. Whether or not they cut actually in March or in May, I think that's a little less relevant. But all the bias is towards cutting rates now. They've been very clear that we've hit peak rates, and they've said more of the same data will mean we cut rates or a weakening in the labor market would mean the same. Well, Lucas, when I, when I listened to Jay Powell, he was saying, you know, listen, I've got to get the inflation back to target. And he was very clear in emphasizing, I don't mean just tapping that target, I mean st holding there. When do you think that occurs, meaning hitting 2% and staying at 2%, Lucas? You know, is that, is that, you know, in the next quarter, six months, 12 months? We're already there. We're already there. The data for the last six months is already showing you inflation below 2%. Now we're just talking about lapping the year so they have more confidence in that data. And forward-looking alternative measures of CPI, such as trueflation or the CPI nowcast, are already printing inflation below 2%. Again, they've set a very low bar. They're going to walk over it fairly soon. Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, the way you paint this, Lukas, you, you sort of make it sound a little nefarious, uh, you know, that the Fed is getting these calls. Or, I mean, it, it, what are the dangers with it starting to cut sometime soon? Well, I do think there's a danger of reaccelerating inflation at some point and potentially reigniting, call it, animal spirits. The reality is that markets can move very far, very fast, even without fundamental data. So it is entirely possible that we return to a bubble-like territory like we've had in 2021. For the real economy, the real issue, I think, is housing and the fact that housing remains so unaffordable and so out of reach for many people. But it's very hard to see what the Fed can really do. They can try to 
crash the housing market or crash the economy, but that's also not good for anyone. So no, I, I don't mean to make it sound nefarious that they're getting calls, but I think there's an understanding that everyone requires lower interest rates um, and the real estate industry in particular. Lucas, I want to get you out of here on this. You know, get, given your take on the Fed rates, inflation, what are the investment implications, Lucas, for you in the equity market? So we don't like to bet on bubbles, but I think that's probably where we're heading. We're heading to a Momo, you know, melt up, if you will. If my expectations of at least four to six interest rate cuts in the next 18 months come true. So we don't like to bet on those kind of bubble outcomes. What I think is a much safer outcome and where we're increasingly putting money in is the energy sector, which has done absolutely nothing for the last 12 months and where I think valuations are actually still very reasonable and quite low. And if we do get a reacceleration in the economy and lower interest rates with the low global inventories that we're having in the energy space, it's very easy for oil to run up and to money for, for money to finally rotate back into that sector. Lukash, thank you so much. Uh, good to have your perspective here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, top names in big tech testified on Capitol Hill today. We'll tell you about the latest social media concerns and some of the fiery exchanges that we saw there on Capitol Hill today. Plus, tech earnings continuing with Qualcomm sent to report after the bell. We'll dive into the numbers from the chip maker later on in the show. Keep it right here.
absolute plunge in shares of New York Community Bank Corp today. It's putting pressure on other regional banking stocks as well. Here with the details, Yahoo Finance's David Hollerith. A little bit of a spring 2023 flashback here, David. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, uh, Julie, so, uh, you know, fourth quarter for NYCB, New York Community Bank, was a time to reset expectations. Um, and obviously, as you pointed out, the, the stock has plunged. Um, the daily drop is it's the worst in the company's history. It's also the worst we've seen uh, since last spring. So what exactly spooked investors? NYCB reported a net loss of $252 million for the fourth quarter. It also slashed its dividend. And the bank did this because it's grown so quickly in recent years that it has to set aside more money for regulatory requirements. It also has higher potential credit losses expected over the next year. Um, in particular, it pointed to two office loans in different parts of uh, New York State. Um, so for context here, NYCB has essentially doubled in size since uh, 2022. Um, it most notably bought uh, Signature Bank's uh, assets, some of its loans and deposits, not its CRE loans. Uh, in the spring last year from the FDIC after Signature failed. Also in 2022, it bought Flagstar Bank. So it's grown a lot. Um, and that has put it into a higher bracket of uh, regulatory requirements. Now, the critical point here is that uh, the bank is trying to account for all that and investors are uh, extremely displeased. And we haven't any, seen any kind of, the, any kind of reaction like this um, since spring. Um, and surprises, I think, uh, we are finding are still very bad for the banking sector. I will point out, though, that other banks have had net losses for the quarter. Those have been bigger banks, and largely investors haven't cared. Um, so the new uh, capital requirements that NYCB is sort of stashing away more money for um, uh, are due in part to the Basel requirements that were proposed this summer. Um, and those aren't finalized. Um, and obviously the industry has come back, uh, has fought back very hard on what those rules look like as they're being proposed. But the ball remains in the Fed's court right now. Earlier today at, at a House uh, Financial Services Committee, Greg Baer, who is a, he's part of an advocacy group for the banking industry, actually did point out the costs under the rules as they exist, these new rules will be extremely high, disproportionately high is what he said for regional banks. David, thank you so much for joining the show today. I always love having you on. Social media CEOs on the hot seat on Capitol Hill today. Lawmakers taking aim at them and their companies over the dangers they pose to children. Senator, our job and what we take seriously is making sure that we build industry-leading tools, find harmful to content, make money. take it off the services, uh, to make money. and to build tools that empower parents. So you didn't take any people. action. You didn't that's take any true, action. Senator. You didn't fire anybody. You haven't that's compensated a single not, victim. Let me I ask said. you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I'm, you like to do so now? Well, They're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? Meta's Mark Zuckerberg apologizing to families of victims at a Senate Judiciary Committee today on safety and social media. Zuckerberg was among the tech execs facing questioning from lawmakers over allegations of abuse on sites like Instagram, TikTok, and X. Joining us now, Jeff Horwitz, Wall Street Journal technology reporter. Jeff, it's good to have you on the show. Maybe just to start, Jeff, uh, give me your take on what we saw on Capitol Hill today. What, what did you learn, Jeff? Um... I think we have, like right now there is a push to get child safety legislation through. Obviously the history of regulating social media companies um, out of Washington has been, um, uh, shall we say, very limited as the um, uh, senators themselves observed. Um, and look, there's certainly some dramatic moments and I think there's no question that people on both sides of the aisle are um, very angry with the company. Um, Unlike with sort of previous uh, hearings, um, say about things involving politics, there was at least a little more of a consensus as to um, 
what the platforms would need to be doing better, uh, namely investing more uh, and being a little more thoughtful in uh, their feature designs and perhaps giving up some of the usage that they, um, you know, that's kind of the lifeblood of the platforms in exchange for safety. Uh, that said, there's, you know, I think the specifics of, of some of the questioning, um, uh, there's long been a question as to whether or not the um, the current Congress, particularly given its uh, the age of most of its members, is well suited to this field of regulation. And I think that will still be outstanding. Right. I mean, at the same time, they see the effects, right, that, that these problems are having. I mean, I was struck by the fact that Zuckerberg said the that science has not shown a causal link between social media and mental health outcomes among young people. So even if they don't know exactly how to fix the problem, it seems as though this, they understand the scope of the problem, right? So, you know, what are kind of the next steps here, I guess, if there are even are any? Yeah, so Zuckerberg said that there was no, like, causal link on the population level. And that is, I think, a, a number of caveats already embedded to the statement. Uh, and as the senators noted, um, the best understanding inside Meta by Meta's own researchers uh, was, in fact, that there are known instances um, and foreseeable instances in which the platforms could be expected to cause harm um, under certain circumstances. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean it say it's net negative for the world um, or that it's responsible for teen suicides, just that there are, um, uh, you know, it's the company's own work at this point is pretty damning on a few fronts. Um, and that stuff has been brought into the public and obviously uh, by both attorneys general and and uh, and the press. Now, what's what's next, I think, is the question of whether any of this stuff results in bills that get to a floor or get to the floor of the Senate. Um, you know, as the committee members themselves have noted, um, the uh, uh, legislations come out of committee before in, in unanimous uh, fashion. It just hasn't ever received a vote. And that's uh, something that um, the Senate leadership obviously has some control about. And, and likewise in the House. Um, so I don't know that there's certainty as to sort of where this goes, but if there is going to be a place where Congress does de decide to pass legislation regulating social media, um, this would be it. Um, this is, you know, the closest thing to consensus among both parties, I think. How much, Jeff, does this also come back to uh, to Section 230, which means, you know, the, these companies, they're not they're not liable for the content on their platforms. I mean, if that changed, that would that would impact the calculus, right? Yeah, there's a lot of I think there's a lot of desire of um, members um, of the committee that to see basically these companies getting sued. Um, and, uh, you know, that that obviously would affect behavior in, in ways that are, are good and potentially harmful and also, you know, restricting of the Internet at large. I think there's a, a lot of concerns about sort of pushing this stuff down to the state AG level um, to determine what's harmful. Um, that said, um, I mean, look, Section 230 um, uh, was sort of written with the idea of a prodigy bulletin board in mind. Um, like, that's the era of technology we're dealing with. It, it certainly, you know, the people who put that together did not predict we'd be dealing with, um, as in the case of our reporting with Meta, recommendation systems that reliably curate child sexualization content for people who wish to consume it at a huge volume, um, right? This is just a, you know, are we allowed to recommend this stuff uh, and are, without any liability is a kind of a different question than is a platform responsible for user-generated content, even if they're still related questions. Jeff Horwitz, um, we know that you've been following this stuff consistently and closely, and we really appreciate your time helping walk us through it. Thanks. So to come on Yahoo Finance, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye, will get analyst insight to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. Stay tuned.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to goodbye or goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're taking to the skies, looking into space travel and the investment opportunities that may be found in the next frontier of commercial trips. What's the best way to play it now? I'm here with Justice Parmer, who's Fortuna Investments CEO. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Julie. Great to be here. Um, so let's get uh, right to what you're looking at and your goodbye stock, the one that you like better. That is Rocket Labs here. Um, and so if we look at the stock over the past year, it's you know kind of come down from a recent peak. But let's talk about your case here. First of all, it's already had some launches. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we should maybe take one step backwards. And yeah. you know we've had a very difficult and very nasty year in, in, in the growth markets for the last 12 to 24 months. So I think everything that's growth related has generally been suppressed. Mm. So we're of the opinion that the rates are coming down this year. It's a presidential year. There's all sorts of great activity starting to be formed. So we actually think that the whole sector is going to rise this year because of some of these amazing catalysts that are coming. Gotcha. So within that sector, we like a company called Rocket Labs, for example. It, it is a smaller company. It's only a $2 billion market cap or so. Um, as you could see on the previous slide, that the stock had been consolidating around right. the 4 to $5 range. And to your point, Julie, the company has done over 40 successful space launches. Hmm. That's very, very, very difficult to do. There's only a handful of companies in the world that have actually been able to do that, SpaceX being the, the leading candidate. Right. And then if you look at the forward looking here, um, situation here, uh, the company has new contracts as well that, uh, that investors can look to. Yeah, you, you bet. They just announced uh, about a month ago, they announced uh, a $500 million record contract, an international contract. So a company, again, you don't have to be a mathematician to start mm -hmm. adding some of these things up where you're, you're in a depressed space or a sector. You've got a company that's been performing really well. You know, I've talked to Peter Beck, the CEO, a number of times, really, really great, smart entrepreneur, starting to strap on massive contracts like these $500 million contracts. You know, there's a lot of potential ups upside opportunity in, in something like this. And to be clear, these are for sat. Do they, you know, when they take the rockets up, are they putting satellites into space? It's not. They're not people riding. Uh, this is not sort of tourism. Correct? correct. Exactly. So, so a company like Rocket Labs is taking, as, as you mentioned, satellites, hardware, payload, non-human things into outer space. There are other companies like Blue Origin and, and Virgin Galactic who are taking tourists or, or people like you and I yeah. into outer space. Well, I guess we talked about the new contracts a little bit already here. But you know, when we look at the market share in this industry as well, as we mentioned, Rocket Lab, yeah. you know, there's not that many players that are doing this kind of thing. So how does Rocket stack up against some of the other players? Well, I mean, and that's just it. A lot of companies have tried. Unfortunately, a lot of companies have failed. But again, this is very, very complicated stuff. This is not, you know, tourism or hospitality or warehouses or, or something that's, I don't want to say more basic, you know, they're, they're taking things into outer space. This is very, very <laughs> difficult stuff. And so, uh, you know, Rocket Labs has is, is, is emerged as an, you know, earlier stage. It's a $2 billion market cap. Mm -hmm. So it's not a you know, trillion dollar company. It's not a Facebook. It's not a Tesla. It's an early speculative company. But if they continue on this trajectory, I think their future is quite bright. All right. Let's talk about the risks as we like to do. And you've sort of alluded to it before that it is a small company. And it's expensive to do this stuff. Yes, they're bringing in revenue to your point, but it's expensive to get these rockets into space, and they're not very large. Uh, you bet. And so that they're, you know, from everything we can gather, they're they're not a profitable company as of yet. They're striving to be kind of cash flow break, break even from our best estimates. They, they spend a lot of money in research and development. They're they're going on to a a new rocket in this coming year. So they've got a smaller rocket with a smaller capsule, and they want to be a mid-range player. So they're going to be spending a lot of money in research and development into developing this mid-range rocket. And so, you know, anytime you're jumping up a class, there is inherently execution risk in some of this. And so, um, ultimately, from my perspective at least, the, the biggest risks are, are Peter Beck and the team being able to execute these very, very complicated, challenging gotcha. things. Yeah. And just to be clear, do, uh, for disclosure purposes, do you own Rocket Lab? No, we don't. We, we okay. do not own Rocket Labs. All right, let's get to the one that you do not like. And this is Virgin Galactic. <laughs> this chart is a little bit different here. It's gone quite down over the past year. A better sort of known name probably in the space here. But let's get into why you don't like it. Basically, you're saying um, here, not necessarily economically viable, the model that exists for this one. That's right. And just to be clear, I'm not, you know, we're, we're not 
haters. We're, we're extremely bullish the entire space mm -hmm. industry and sector. We've got multiple investments in, in different areas of the field. Um, but when you look at a company like Virgin Galactic, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm a huge Richard Branson fan. He's, he's been you know, a great entrepreneur. He's done tremendously well in records and cruise lines and airlines and all sorts of amazing things. But this particular company, to date, they've had a lot of serious challenges. Um, you know, they've gone through over a billion dollars in capital. Mm -hmm. They've had a technology that's been really challenging to integrate. And currently, um, they've actually just recently, last week, as of last week, they've launched their 11th successful space flight. So what that means is they've actually got humans like you and I into outer space 11 times successfully, which is remarkable. That's really, really exciting. So um, there is some really, really good stuff in there, but there's also some stuff that's, you know, seriously well, challenged. Let's yeah. I mean, 11 is great, but you also <laughs> pointed out in your notes, was that that's difficult to scale, right? If you look at the, like, sort of cost per passenger and revenue per passenger with these relatively small flights into space, they're not going to make money unless you could make a much bigger rocket, for example, or maybe fly a lot more missions. <laughs> That's just it. And so when you run the you know, back of the envelope calculations, right? So that each rocket's got eight seats. And so their last price sheet is it's $250,000 or a quarter million dollars per head to go to outer space. Expensive, but not a terribly bad deal in a certain capacity. And so um, they've got eight seats on the rocket. Let's assume they're able to do one a month, which they haven't been able to do yet. Mm -hmm. And so 250 times eight is $2 million. $2 million times 12 months is $24 million. So their revenue profile currently, if they do one a month, is $24 million, which might sound like a lot of money, but then when you look at their balance sheet and their financial statements, they're losing almost $200 million a quarter. Right. And so there's a big discrepancy yeah. there, unfortunately. And they're trying to raise money through selling more shares. So then that dilutes the value. That's exactly it. And so even their, their last financing, it wasn't a traditional Goldman Sachs financing. It was, it was something called an ATM at the market. And, and what, what that means is the company will actually issue shares from Treasury and fulfill the demand in the marketplace. So effectively, it actually caps the stock in a certain way. And so when you actually look at the company and you, re, you really look at it, they, they've got $1.1 billion in assets on their ba balance sheet. Not assets, sorry, liquid, liquid assets. So, mm -hmm. so cash and cash equivalents. Their market cap, if you pull them up, they're only about an $800 million valued company. So they have more cash than their actual total market cap. Mm. So they're actually minus $200 with a value. And that gives you, I guess, maybe an idea of how the street or you know, investors are, are viewing this right. at this current time. Okay, just like we looked at the risk to the upside for Rocket, risk to the downside here, that they would you know, slash costs perhaps and make it happen for them. So I th yeah, so I, I, th I think they've, they've been trying to slash costs, especially over this last quarter here. Um, they've still got a tremendously long way to go on that. Um, but I think the bigger you know, elephant in the room in a certain way is actually the, the fact that we just, or the, the, the point that we just talked about, which is economically, it's gonna be really hard to crank a lot of revenue in that current eight seat rocket. Mm -hmm. And so even those eight seats, they, they've actually been comping some of them for, you know, for celebrities and different people like that. So they're actually not even doing the, the two million per right. head. So they're inherently, much like the Rocket Labs example, they're inherently gonna have to make a brand new rocket and capsule to really start to carry more passengers and make mm -hmm. it more economical. And so the good news is they have a billion dollars or $1.1 billion to do it and a bit of a runway. Um, but again, the, I guess the topic or the bumper sticker yeah. is this is very, very challenging stuff. And so gotcha. we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. All right, well, Justice, thanks so much. Let's uh, kind of summarize what you've talked about here. You say buy Rocket Lab based on the company's success so far, the potential for growth, a lot of new contracts. On the other side, you say avoid Virgin Galactic given the slowing. Um, the economic viability there and the current positioning of the stock. Thank you so much, Justice. Appreciate it, Justin Palmer. And thanks to you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be right back.
The closing bell ringing on Wall Street stocks are selling off into the close on the heels of Jay Powell's news conference, where he said right now a March rate cut is not the central bank's base case, dashing the hopes for the remaining people, perhaps, who were hoping for that. And so we are seeing all three major averages lower here. The NASDAQ looks like it's set for its worst day since October 25th, but still higher on the month for the major averages. But really quite a plunge there for NASDAQ, which was down more than 1% before the press conference began. And then the losses accelerated um, after Jay Powell made that particular comment. Yeah, and it was a roller coaster day here on Wall Street, thanks to the Federal Reserve and Chair Jerome Powell. Jared Blickery is here with all the details. Jared. Thank you, Josh. It was a day where we were just about green in the Dow right before the announcement. You can see we plummeted uh, down 317 points for the close. It's not a lot, but in the S&P 500, down 1.61 percent. And Julie, as you said, NASDAQ having probably its worst day since last October. So something to keep in mind. And the Russell 2000 off even more, down 2.5 percent. And all 11 sectors finished in the red. Healthcare was uh, just slightly in the green only a few minutes ago, but utilities, real estate, state. Those were in the green earlier, basically sunk into the red by the close. And communication services and tech uh, finishing down below 2 percent. And look at a couple, a couple of those stocks in a second. And then energy also not faring well as either. So let's take a look, a final look at the Dow. We looked at the NASDAQ 100 a little while ago. United Health in the green, bucking the trend there, along with Johnson & Johnson, Intel, and Boeing up 5 percent. Big day for Boeing. Uh, but Microsoft finishing the day down 2, two and a half percent. And Apple almost down 2 percent. And let's take a look at our leaderboard here, some of our sentiment indicators. Not a lot in the green. Uh, Chinese stocks finishing at the flat, at the flat line there. And regional banks down 5.91 percent, ARC down 3 percent. Let me just get to those regional banks, because this was a huge uh, play today. This announcement uh, by New York Community Bank, and let me get the uh, let me get an equal rate of view here. There we go, down 37 percent to finish the day. But this announcement came early in the morning, and uh, this was something we were playing with all day in the back of a lot of people's head, heads, and really didn't make much play at the Fed announcement. Nevertheless, uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on these regional banks for the days and weeks to come, guys. Thanks so much, Jared. Appreciate it. We've got breaking news here coming from Qualcomm. Mm -hmm. That company out with its numbers just in the past few moments. First quarter adjusted earnings per share coming in at $2.75. That's versus the $2.36 that analysts had been anticipating. Adjusted revenue in the first quarter, $9.92 billion. That too, ahead of estimates. And then we got some second quarter estimates as well. Second quarter forecasts, I should say, from the company. Second quarter revenue going to be $8.9 to $9.9. $7 billion. Uh, analysts had estimated $9.36 billion on that basis. And the company says second quarter earnings per share going to be in the range of $220 to $240. The estimate was $226. So I guess if you take the midpoint of $220 to $240, you get $230, which is above where analysts have been anticipating. But you see the shares bouncing around a little bit in the after hours. I also want to point out what we saw on the sector level, because Qualcomm has really been trying to diversify. Its bread and butter is smartphone chips, right? It is a big Apple supplier, among others. But it has been trying to diversify away from that market as well. So I just want to point out what we're seeing in terms of the breakdown of the revenue streams here. So handset revenue rising 16% percent um, year over year here to six point call it six nine billion dollars the automotive segment that's been one of its fastest growth segments up 31 percent to 598 million dollars and then finally internet of things has been another growth segment there but there it saw revenue fall by 32 percent to about 1.14 billion dollars um, so um, those are the, the various business lines. Josh, uh, what do you make of the numbers as we as we look at this and, and what we kind of want to find out from Qualcomm? Yeah, so Qualcomm, one of those names, by the way, who in the last few months really saw a big move mm -hmm. into, into this print. The initial reaction here in the after hours, investors like what they see. Um, listen, they are the biggest maker of phone processors, so it's going to be really interesting to look, hear more about how they see the smartphone market, which has been lackluster, but how do they see kind of playing out in 2024? Color and commentary, what are the growth drivers. As you noted to Julie, they have made real efforts here to diversify their business, right? Pushing into these new areas like the PC where they have 
talked a, a big game, really kind of how they stack up against rivals like Apple and Intel. Um, and I think China will be interesting as well. You know, this is another company where China is an important market and obviously shake economy over there, geopolitical tensions. How do they kind of navigate that too? Yeah, we didn't get any, the, all of this will come on the call, right? Where yep. we get more color on all of this. Um, but the, you know, Cristiano Aman, uh, who is the CEO of the company, um, not giving a lot of discussion about that, but he did talk about what we were seeing driven by on-device generative AI across handsets, automotive PC, um, and industrial IoT, among other things. So uh, we'll get more from the call. Yeah, and, nice, uh, nice pop, at least initially, after yeah, hours. Unlike what we saw for, say, an AMD, for example, or the other big tech earnings we for got sure. yesterday. All right, we move on. It is a big week for big tech, especially with artificial intelligence in focus. Both Microsoft and Alphabet facing investor concerns around higher costs amid the ongoing AI arms race. And my next guest is at the forefront of what's happening in that space. Joining me now is Joe Lonsdale, 8VC founding partner and Palantir co-founder. Joe, it is good to have you on the show and to see you. And maybe I'll, I'll just start there, Joe. You know, listen, we've heard from some big tech names this week. I got Microsoft and Alphabet. We got Amazon, Apple, Meta on deck and we know a focus for investors, Joe, it has been on AI. I guess just to start, Joe, I'm curious, how do you see that technology kind of evolving from here, Joe? And do you believe we're going to really start seeing now this real ramp in use cases and, and monetization? It's great to see you, Josh. <clears throat> you know, AI is a big story in the venture capital world. It's what we're focused on. These things take a little while to build. Most of the money right now is in infrastructure. It's in the obvious applications of AI. The, the big applications, though, for the for the decade, for the 2020s, is going to be in productivity. And you're going to start seeing productivity hit a lot of areas in the next few years. A lot of these are smaller now. We're still building them, but we're building them quickly. You're going to start seeing, I mean, you talk to guys like Michael Dell at Dell. You know, he's expecting a lot of higher productivity the next couple of years at Dell in certain areas. But it's going to spread to, I think, pro probably most of the Fortune 500. I think this is very bullish overall over kind of a five-year period. You're going to start seeing the numbers, I think, in the economy hit 26, 27, most likely, would be my guess. And Joe, I'd imagine there's a lot of AI founders, startups knocking on your door. How do you as a venture investor, Joe, how do you kind of separate, let's call it hype from reality? Well, you know, it's like everything else. The two things that matter the most in venture capital, it's it's top talent and what's possible now that wasn't possible before. And that and, and what's possible to create real economic value is what we're looking at, right? So, you know, if, if you're just sprinkling a little bit of AI pixie dust on something and suddenly it works, that's actually probably not very valuable as a real company. The things that you actually have to do, Josh, to make most of these things work is a lot of really hard data work. A lot like the stuff we did back at Palantir in the day and the Palantir still does today is like going into these places, organizing the ontologies, putting the workflows together, and then using what's possible in AI, plus these workflows. And this is applying to things, you know, I'll give you an example, healthcare billing, you know, a couple hundred billion dollars a year spent on that in the US. We're gonna probably make this three or four times more productive. It's gonna save the, the country a lot of money, it's gonna make a lot of money. And there's, there, there's probably a dozen areas like that that are that big where we can fix them. And Joe, let's talk about another area where, where you have a lot of expertise in, and that's that's the defense tech uh, area, Joe. You know, you, you co-founded Palantir, co-founded Epirus. You were, you know, early investor in Palmer Lucky's Anduril. How is AI kind of upending, redefining defense? I mean, AI is actually, you know, it's absolutely critical for defense here. You you need people and computers to work together. You need to have the people do what they're the best at, and computers do what they're the best at. And when it comes to targeting and tracking and a lot of different tactics. Uh, people aren't fast enough anymore if you're competing with AI. People are still part of the equation. They're part of the strategy. They're deciding what we're going to do in war. But, you know, if you have swarms of little ships and in, in the you make a thousand small ships that are weaponized for the cost of one big ship and how those ships work together, how they go on missions, that's, you know, if you're targeting drones that are coming in, we saw the drones, unfortunately, attack us in Jordan the other day. AI systems should be identifying if they're friend or foe. We didn't have those there. And AI systems should be shooting them down with technology like EPRIS, EMP. You can take microwave radiation, turn these drones off from far away. Way, protect American lives, protect allies' lives. This is all stuff where AI plays a key part, and we need to make the DoD go faster in implementing it. Well, why, why isn't that, Joe? Why aren't these technologies getting to American war fighters faster? Well, you know, it, it's, it's actually really frustrating as a patriot, Josh. Back in the 1990s, 2000s, when I was at Stanford, we'd hear of stories of how the government was so far ahead in the 60s and 70s. There's stuff that the NSA and others did in the 70s that we didn't figure out until 20 years later why they were doing it, you know, in the top of academia and other places. Nowadays, a lot of the best talent's gone to Silicon Valley during the first bubble 20 years ago. Uh, if you're a really great technologist, you go into companies, you're paid really well, you own a big piece of it. If you go into the 
DOD is a great technologist right now. Most of them reject that culture because you're not treated respectfully there. It takes 20, 30 years to get to the top. So the DOD does not understand software, does not understand these cultures, doesn't even know if it has the best people or not. And that's a, that's a huge cultural problem there. And, you know, there's a lot of great generals and admirals that are kind of aware of this. They're trying to work with the best new companies. They're trying to fix it. There's a big, slow bureaucracy, and it's controlled by the old giant defense companies. And so they're generally pretty slow right now. Is that where a company like, like in your opinion, Joe, like Anduril comes in? This is this, you know, Anduril's done a great job not only of attracting some of the very top talents, some of our best buys from Palantir are there, obviously Palmer Lucky, you know, and others have recruited amazing people, but they've done a great job of building a game on the hill. When you're building a defense company, you need to build the best new technologies to, to, to you know, terrify our, our enemies, but you also need to build a really good game on the hill in DC where you're teaching Congress, teaching a DOD what you're doing and why it's so much better. And they've done a great job of both of those. It's a good lesson to others to, to follow. And Andrew, Andrew's doing amazing work. And Joe, you talked about, you know, potential advantages of, ha you know, deploying AI on the battlefield. What are some risks though, Joe? How concerned are you about bad actors employing this technology? You know, any new technology is going to have bad actors using it along with good actors. And listen, our enemies, I mean, I mean, China, Iran, Russia, there, there are people there who are using AI to build things as well. They're going to have great systems. They're going to be really advanced. Ours need to be better than theirs. And so, so and, you know, is, is it scary that, I mean, is there some like kind of future where AI takes over and goes and attacks people? I mean, I think that's kind of ridiculous. Like maybe that's something that, you know, in the far, far future with AI, you know, to, to, to worry about. But right now the question is, can our systems outperform their systems? Can our systems save lives and protect lives? Or, or can, they def, can they defeat the bad guys? And right now we have the best software in the world in the US and we need to use it to make sure we stay ahead of them and we protect American lives and defeat them. And Joe, I want, I want to switch gears here a bit, talking about another subject uh, near and dear to your heart, which is American politics. You know, Joe, you were a, a supporter of Governor DeSantis, um, a believer. I think you donated to his campaign. Obviously, he's out. It certainly looks like, Joe, at this point, Trump could secure that nomination. If he does, Joe, do you throw your support behind Trump in 2024? You know, Josh, I've spent most of my time working in states. The reason I had back to Santos earlier is I, I, you know, Cicero Institute, which I work on, is a nonpartisan institute. We're in 19 states. He was one of the most competent governors we'd work with, getting great things done. And you know, I was disappointed he, you know, didn't work out from the national stage. And uh, you know, in general, I'm I'm not that involved in in the presidential election. I will say I'm very frustrated to see uh, this current administration going after friends of mine like Elon Musk illegitimately and, and attacking them in so many different ways with activists right now. It's, it's extraordinarily frustrating. So, you know, I, I can imagine getting involved just because I'm pissed off that they're unfairly attacking good people. All right, Joe, I want to get you out on this. You have a, a new university as well I want to talk about. The university in Texas Board of Trustees includes people like Barry Weiss, uh, Niall Ferguson. Why did you start that university, Joe? What's the problem you're, you're trying to solve for? Well, Neil and Barry are, are just have been amazing co-founders here with Pano and others. You know, Josh, we're trying to have one of the universities that's one of the top universities in our country not be run by illiberal forces. I think you we started this two years ago. People didn't know what I was talking about. You've seen now since October 7th some of the things coming out of our universities. I think a lot of people have woken up and said, wow. These places have been conquered by ideologues who are extremely radical, who don't represent America, who don't allow free speech, don't allow debates, don't you know, don't stand up to anti-Semitism at the same time that they're they're going after anyone who violates any of their woke shibboleths. It's uh, these places are broken. You know what we need, Josh, is we need a place where young people come. They learn to have open debates. They're able to argue both sides, and they're able to learn how to be courageous citizens to fight for the future of America. And and, and right now we don't have that. Other schools. I want a place that people who are proud of America, who want to be part of the solution can come and can learn how to do that. And Joe, though, you know, if, if the issue is on those campuses, Joe, did you ever think about maybe, you know, if that's the problem, that you would put more time and energy and effort into kind of changing the culture at Amer established American colleges and universities rather than starting your own? You know, a lot of us have spent a lot of money trying to do things like this. And it's kind of like saying, did you go to IBM and fix it? Or do you start Palantir? And what's happened at these universities, Josh, people don't realize uh, you have, you know, departments have not have not brought in people to disagree with them for a very long time. Their professors are in charge there. There's more administrators at these schools. Yale and Harvard have more administrators than students, and the administrators are far more radical ideologically than even the professors. You have hordes of lawyers. I mean, it's, it's not just that the pr presidents that we just fired at Harvard were corrupt. It's that there's multiple corrupt layers underneath them that have been conquered over the last 30 years. These places are, are going to take generation to fix at least. And we need at least one place to prove that it's possible to have a great university again that's not conquered by crazy people. Joe, I appreciate you having the show. And it's always clear where you stand. And we appreciate that. Thanks for the time. Thank you.
Qualcomm right now in the after hours on the back of their latest earnings. We're going to take a deeper dive. Looks like about 3% higher right now. We're going to take a dive into that name, the print, all the numbers on the other side. Let's take a look at Qualcomm shares after the company beat expectations in its first quarter numbers. The share's up by about 3% here, and its forecast for the current quarter leaves it some ample room to beat estimates. Let's bring in Patrick Moorhead, more Insight Strategy founder and CEO. Hey, Patrick, good to see you. So Qualcomm here looks like it's benefiting from a little bit of a smartphone recovery, perhaps, and its auto business continues to grow as well. What stood out to you? Yeah, that's right, Julie. Uh, the one thing coming in that I wanted, I wasn't clear on is we knew the smartphone market was going up between seven and eight percent, but what part of that would be Qualcomm's? Uh, you have iPhone that's gaining market share, where Qualcomm has content, but not as much content, and Samsung went went back a little bit, where Qualcomm has more content, and yeah, they they beat revenue by by four percent, and they fully took advantage of that. And the big question on automotive was, would the design win and content increases be maybe nullified uh, by the reduction in sales out or actual sales of cars? And they were up 31 percent, uh, did better than I had expected. And, and, you know, Patrick, they're also, of course, I mean, it's great to see you. They, they're diversifying their business in other ways. This, this push into, into PC chips, Patrick. What do you think the trajectory of that business looks like over the next few quarters? Yeah, so it, it really starts to uh, to get interesting in the second quarter as they start building 
uh, inventory and shipping it to PC makers, they can start selling in the May and June timeframe. And I think it'll start off as small, but I see in the next uh, two years where I could see the company getting 10% market share uh, of, of notebooks uh, or, or even more. And those are premium parts with an ASP of around $300. And that's all upside, right? Because Qualcomm has really never uh, put its mark on the PC market. It's been out there kind of testing stuff, but this is where, and at least based on the recent uh, benchmarks, even compared to the latest and greatest from Intel, they have a very solid design. And Patrick, that's actually where I, where I want to go next, because on these PC chips, they, they've talked a, a bold game, Patrick, right? I mean, how they're going to outperform rivals like Apple, like Intel. You agree with that? So right now, based on some of the, I call it guerrilla marketing or guerrilla reviews, where a system have, it hasn't shipped yet, but they're, they're dropping uh, developer notebooks out there at the reviewers, uh, uh, Qualcomm has a sizable advantage, particularly uh, on the AI side. And then when it comes to even the CPU part, CPU portion, even versus Apple's latest and greatest with the M3, because if you step back, uh, Apple currently has the highest performance and highest performance per watt uh, part in a notebook. And, and there are figures coming out that show Qualcomm is even beating that design. Um, and they talk about that in this release, by the way, in their Internet of Things business, which did see a year over year decline, by the way, they're talking, they're emphasizing talking in this big game, right? They talk about that their new uh, Snapdragon X Elite, which formally comes out in mid this year, will set the industry benchmark for on device gen AI and co pilot experiences. You know, Patrick, I got to say, when we talk to investors and we say, what's the next big AI play? <laughs> Qualcomm is not the one that is named, you know, people talk about AMD, they talk about some other companies. Qualcomm has not come up as often. Are people sleeping on Qualcomm? So I think they are, but but it's natural because where a lot of the action was to start was in the data center. And you saw names like NVIDIA and AMD, and even on the networking side, that was really all about the data center. But as we see with all software, it, it makes its way onto the device itself because it is the most efficient place to do certain types of tasks. And in this case, AI. So you're going to see uh, Qualcomm with its AI smartphones. You're going to see Qualcomm with its AI PCs. And we recently saw Intel did a huge launch uh, at Consumer Electronics Show with their first take at AI PC. And we're hearing the same thing from AMD. So yes, I do believe part of the second wave of AI beneficiaries are going to be those on the endpoints, the PCs, the devices that can deliver improved experiences. And while Apple's not talking about it a lot, you better bet they are making plans to do the same exact thing on the iPhone and also on the Mac. And, and Patrick, let me also get your take on China. You know, that, that's an important market for Qualcomm, but you know, it, the economy there is shaky, of course, geopolitical tensions. How does Qualcomm navigate that, that kind of dynamic over the next few quarters and years, frankly? Yeah, so Qualcomm, uh, short term, is very well positioned there. I mean, not only are they, they have 90 plus percent of premium Android, uh, they're also taking a good deal uh, of the mid-range. Now, the last thing I would want to do is, is, is predict uh, what the Chinese government uh, would do as we're in, in this tit for tat. I mean, you see uh, Micron getting punished uh, just for showing up uh, in China, unfortunately. But the thing about it in the short term is that China needs Qualcomm uh, for growth because the Chinese government sees the combination of the most competitive and performative endpoints combined with the most performative uh, telco and very connected to the cloud. And as long as Qualcomm keeps the roadmap going, it can't be duplicated. I still think they're in a very good position. But as you know, making long-term bets on what's gonna happen in China is a tricky thing. It is a tricky thing and we're gonna keep watching it. Patrick, thanks so much for your perspective as always. Great to get your thoughts on anything having to do with the chip industry. Thank you. Thanks, Julie and Josh.
We're going to get more on Qualcomm tomorrow. I'll be speaking tomorrow morning with Qualcomm CEFO Akash Palkiwala. That's at 10 a.m. Eastern. So we'll be discussing more about what we heard from the company and what we're going to hear on the call. Let's get to a trending ticker that caught our eye today. Adidas shares, the U.S. traded shares, trading sharply lower today, down by 9.4%. And that's after the company came out with an operating profit forecast that fell far short of what analysts had been anticipating here. A lot of it having to do with currency. This is the latest company that in particular talked about what was going on with the devaluation in Argentina and the effect that that is having on the company. So this year, operating profit only going to be about 500 million euros. Analysts have been looking for more than double that, 1.27 billion euros. Josh, you spotted the uh, statement coming from the CEO. Mm -hmm where he perhaps stated the obvious, but it's not usual that you get something like this. I know, that, it, it does strike you. You don't see something like this, kind of this clearly, where the CEO says, Julie, here in a statement, we do, of course, know that our financial performance is not good. Those were his words. He does add, we say, you know, the attitude and agility in our teams are back. Goes on to say the company has shown the, the old Adidas DNA again. It doesn't look like, at least initially here, investors are are convinced. Yeah, it's interesting too because how are they going to try and make up for this? They are going to sell some of that Yeezy gear that has been hanging around. Remember when they said they were discontinuing yep. their partnership with Ye, uh, the performer formerly known as Kanye West, that they there were some questions about what they were going to do with all that gear. So they have been selling some of it off. Now they're going to sell the remaining Yeezy inventory at cost, they said, uh, aiming to generate sales of 250 million euros instead of writing it off, was, which was one of the other options. We've been seeing some pressure, by the way, on shares of Nike and Under Armour as well as a result of this announcement, which, by the way, came midday New York time, this Adidas forecast. So watching all of those stocks. Well, you remember when Nike last reported, that certainly raised some concerns about not just the company, by the sector. So this kind of adding some fuel to that for sure. Yeah. All right, coming up, Swiss pharmaceutical giant, uh, pharmaceutical giant Novartis was down today on the back of their latest earnings report. We're going to hear from the CEO on the other side of the break. You won't want to miss that conversation.
Pharmaceutical giant Novartis reported its fourth quarter results earlier today. The company's income gains aided by strength in a string of new drug launches, though some did fall short of market expectations. Over the past year, the company has undergone an ambitious restructuring plan, spinning off its generic drug arm and aiming for $1.5 billion in cost cuts by the end of this year. With more on the company's innovation push and much more, I'm joined by Novartis CEO Vas Narasimhan. Great to see you, Vas. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here, Julie. So I want to just dive right in and talk about your forecast here. You guys forecast core operating profit to rise in the high single-digit percentage range this year, sales up mid-single-digit percentage. You know, last year, you guys raised your full-year forecast, I think, three times. So should investors be viewing this forecast as conservative? You know, we characterize it on today's conference call as prudent, and we want to be prudent given that we have some loss of exclusivities over the course of this year, which will create some headwinds for us. But you know what? I think the more important message is our underlying growth rate of double-digit growth and our growth drivers is continuing. That's what fueled our growth in 2023, allowed the 10% sales growth, 18% core operating income growth. That also is what gave us confidence to uh, increase our guidance for 2023 to 2028. Uh, to 5% plus sales growth in that five-year period. So while next year we will have a, a little more headwinds from LOE, loss of exclusivities, as you know, in our sector, that's a, a big role. We think we have the growth drivers to grow over the years to come. Um, and I want to zero in on one of your drugs in particular that was disappointing versus what analysts were expecting last quarter. That's Pluvicto, your prostate uh, cancer treatment. You talked on the call about how the supply issues that have affected that drug should abate, and you see unconstrained supply heading forward. So what can investors expect from Puluvicto for this year, and do you think you're going to get in additional indications approved as well? Yeah, you know, Pluvicto is one of the important growth drivers for the coming years for Novartis. It's part of our radio ligand therapy portfolio, where we're the global leader, a really novel medicine that can target nuclear radiation directly to a cancer. We've got into this medicine being a multi-billion dollar medicine, and we wanted to reach nearly a billion dollars of sales in 2023, which we did accomplish. Now that we have our new manufacturing site in Indianapolis up and running, that gives us the opportunity to have unconstrained supply. We actually ended last year with 99.9% .9 on-time delivery, which shows that we're back now to a very strong supply situation. So over the course of this year, we expect robust quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth each quarter to get us continuing to march up to that multi-billion dollar potential. Now, what's going to be important for this medicine to reach its full potential is we're going to have to get approvals in earlier lines of prostate cancer. Right now, we're awaiting an update on some data in the pre-taxane setting, so the pre-chemotherapy setting, uh, which will allow us one step. And then we have two other studies ongoing in even earlier lines of prostate cancer. Each one of these increases the market opportunity for Pluvicto multifold. So that's why I think there's a lot of focus on this medicine. It's got a, a really strong outlook, and we feel confident we'll get back to a strong growth trajectory in quarter one. Um, now, obviously, that's in the oncology branch. You have these sort of four focus areas that you and I have talked about before. There is a lot of competition in oncology right now, a lot of your competitors expanding as well, trying to get into new uh, platforms for their therapy. So how are you thinking about competition right now? You know, oncology, I mean, really across the sector, we see significant competition. But in oncology in particular, given how hard it is to find a really good oncology drug. So we really try to think about where do we have unique science and unique capabilities. I mentioned radio ligand therapy. While much of the industry is focused on what are called antibody drug conjugates, we're focused on this area of called radio ligand therapy, where we have two medicines already on the market doing well a broad pipeline, a broad capability in terms of our supply chain. So that's one area of focus. Another area is hematology, where we have a long, long track record of excellence. Earlier this month, we announced uh, exciting new data for a drug called Semblix, uh, which beat Gleevec, which was one of the most successful cancer drugs in history, in a head-to-head -head study in the frontline setting of treating this cancer called chronic myelogenous leukemia. That's another example of where we're taking our unique capabilities in, uh, in hematology to find new medicines. So I think the key in oncology is finding spaces where you have unique capabilities that your competitors don't. Uh, and that's going to be really critical now as the, as the market continues to get more and more competitive. 
Um, I want to ask about what we're seeing from the stock today. As you know, uh, both the U.S. shares and the Swiss shares trading a little bit lower, but we have seen the stock rally uh, into the print here. And I've seen some analysts sort of question the, the company's valuation. So I'm just curious how you're thinking about the, the reaction in the shares today. And do you think the shares are, are fairly valued where they are right now? You know, I try not to read too much into the single day trading movements of, of our shares. I mean, when you look at last year, we were number three in total shareholder return in the sector. When I look at the five year and the three year, we're in the top half or the top quartile in most of these uh, segments. So I think that's where we want to be at the end of this year. So intraday trading, as you know, there's a lot of puts and takes as to why those things happen. I think more important for us is gonna to be to keep delivering on sales growth, margin expansion, as we've outlined uh, in the quarter. And, and really important will be the launches and these pipeline submissions and, and readouts that we have planned. As those come forward, I'm certain the, sh the shares will recover and then continue the trajectory uh, that we've been on. We still trade at a, at a small, at a discount to the other pure plays in uh, the pharmaceutical sector. We're still, I think, re-rating up from being a conglomerate when we had Alcon, Sandoz, trying to re-rate up as a pure play, and I, I expect that to continue. And Voss, I wanna ask you about policy for a minute too, because you right now are serving uh, as the chair of the Board of Pharma, which is the Drug Industry Association here in the US. When we spoke in Davos a short while ago, you talked a little bit about your concern that the IRA could sort of serve as a constraint on drug development over the longer term. Is that message sort of getting a hearing in Washington? And, and do you have anything to tell us about what could potentially change or talks that you're having on that front? So this is a critical topic, probably the, the number one topic for the industry in the United States. Uh, just for the listener's understanding, uh, part of the IRA is to create a price setting provision, which kicks in after 13 years for drugs that are called biologics or, or injectable medicines, but only after nine years for small molecules and other, uh, so pills and other related drugs uh, in, in, in the world of medicines. We call it the pill penalty. So nine years is simply too short. If you think about a cancer drug, it takes as many years to move through all the different lines of therapy for cancer. If you think about a cardiovascular drug, it takes six, seven years for these medicines to reach their full potential. So what you're gonna have then is companies de-investing in these types of medicines for the elderly. We're gonna focus more on people under the age of 65, which is, I think, not on the best interests of healthcare in the United States. So I think policymakers are understanding the challenge, understanding we need to fix this, but at the same time, the political reality is nothing is gonna move on this topic, I think, after until after the presidential. Right. And, and Vash, so just, our focus will be educating this year. Yeah, and just quickly, sorry, so how do you get, if, if not in this way, what's the best way to get drug costs under control for the patients? You know, one of the big reforms that I hope will pass over the course of the next few months is pharmaceutical benefit manager reform. I mean, it's important to note for a pharmaceutical company, on average across our portfolio, a company like Novartis only gets about 50% of the price for a medicine that we charge. And the other 50% is going into the supply chain. So I think that's one important fix to make sure those savings actually get to patients and actually enable patients to afford their medicines. I think one of the other important shifts you're going to see is with the IRA, there's an out-of-pocket cap at $2,000 that will kick in over the course of the next, at the end of this year. That will make medicines much more affordable and I think will change the dialogue because people will be able to afford their medicines because the insurance is structured in a way to manage those out-of-pocket costs. So these are things I think that absolutely can be done. The truth is this government negotiation is not going to lead to less, better affordability at the pharmacy counter for patients. This was a tax that was put on our industry to fund other priorities in energy and other sectors. And it's something I hope will get corrected in the years to come. Well, we will continue this conversation, I'm sure, over the coming year and years. Vaz Narasimhan, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Julie. We've got much more coming up on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Pross Subramani alongside Alexander Canal, excuse me, and Brooke De Palma. <laughs> You're about to call me Alexis Airlines or something? <laughs> Alaska Airlines? I know you have airlines on the brain, Pross. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We're kicking. It wasn't that bad, right? We're kicking <laughs> things off looking at Boeing earnings, the playmaker beating on estimates on the top and bottom line, though suspending its 2024 guidance. But the stock up over 5% here. You know, a lot of analysts here, the consensus is that they'll actually bring back that, that, that guidance at some point, probably at, at the end of the first quarter. We'll see. But um, analyst Louis De Palma, no relation, right? Yeah, at no William relation, Blair, no relation. Uh, says that the backlog is strong at $441 billion for, for Boeing. Uh, he says that the production cap for the MAX will actually be lifted at some point. The FAA kind of capped that because of the issues that are having with, with manufacturing. And that he says the shares deserve a premium. I mean, these are all good arguments, but I think from my point of view, big picture, I think Boeing is going to need a lot of time to fix the cultural sort of rot that people are calling it. Dave Callen saying all the right words, but guess what? United CEO, Alaska CEO, they're really pissed off right now at Boeing. Yeah. And I got to say, you know, I can't blame them for what's going on. I think this is going to take, again, a lot of time to fix. Yeah, I feel like they kind of had no choice here but to hold that guidance, really trying to take a respectable approach here and sort of take a step back, evaluate the situation. I mean, it just happened earlier this month. So how do you sort of set a precedent for what the rest of the year is going to look like when really we don't know too much? And I really think this is sort of creating a confusion on both Main Street and Wall Street among consumers. We were just chatting before about how now I'm taking a second look at what kind of plane I'm, I'm mm -hmm. taking anywhere. And I never used to do that previously, of course, a few years ago after that saga on the 7th. 37 max seems like we were moving away from that now we're back but now i take a second look and it's caused a lot of confusion and you're talking about company culture trust among consumers passengers as well is also something i think will be in focus as well yeah brooke i have quite a few flights planned for this year yeah. and i already don't fly the window seat but i am <laughs> not flying the window seat if there's a chance so i never once had a question on. about flying the window seat i like the window seat well it's funny it's not funny but when you think about a company like boeing they've just been hit again mm -hmm. and again and again with all of these really bad pr controversies yeah. right and it seems like though it's been able to bounce back considering how dire a lot of these situations were and it just got me thinking about the inventory out there boeing mm -hmm. is besides Airbus, one of the biggest suppliers, especially for an uh, airline like United, for example, that you mentioned. I mean, they supply most of those planes. Is there really much of a choice here? It's like yeah. Boeing's the only game in town. Yeah. And like you mentioned, Lad, there's they have like over like 4,000 planes on back order, right? They have a ton of back order they have to make. Like, it's going to be years to do this. After the United CEO was upset about that whole thing with the MAX, Ryanair CEO said, we'll buy all the planes they don't want. Right. So there's definitely... There's no supply there and other uh, airlines will come in and say, oh, you don't want this plane? We'll buy them. Yeah. You know, so you're yeah. absolutely right. Putting about in a that. tough spot. Yeah. Supply issue, uh, you know, a big problem there. But speaking of, you know, supply and demand, I want to go to one stock that I'm watching, and that's Paramount Global, because we have potentially a buyer out there. Shares are seeing a pop after a Bloomberg report that media mogul Byron Allen is making a $14.3 billion bid to buy all of Paramount's outstanding shares. Now, according to the report, Allen offered $20. $28.58 each for the company's voting shares. Now, that marks about a 50% premium compared to recent trading levels. And then for those non-voting shares, it would be $21.53. Still, that's significantly ahead of where we're seeing shares right now, even despite that pop. But look, Paramount's long been rumored as an acquisition target. It's very small. It has a lot of issues, but analysts are saying that this could potentially be a probable deal, considering the fact that Byron Allen is very interested in the linear side of the business. Who wants to buy a dying linear media business? Yeah, he, Byron Allen does. And, and that's something that I think really, uh, you know, perplexed analysts when you were thinking about a potential buyer mm -hmm. here. But if he wants to sell the studio film side of the business, which is what this report suggested, that could potentially fund the deal because the financing has been a little murky and Wells Fargo argues that that funding could be what really saves it. And here. this is not his first time offering. He seems like he's right. super eager to get to the table. I got, I got to say, I love his letter here. Since our last offer in, in April, yeah. the stock price has declined 37%. 
Yeah. Hence the lower offer right now for the for the business. But you're absolutely right though. That's a great way to fund that did deal right. all cash deal if you can just sell off that studio part. I mean, look, the board now has to go into sale mode. They got a, a real live offer, cash offer. They have to weigh these things. Maybe uh, Skydance will come in, right? Or, mm -hmm. or, Buy the or studio WBD, business, right? Mm -hmm. To actually still have like nice, like kind of uh, bidders thing. at the gate there. But it's it's for sale. It's live right now. Yeah. It's live. Talks are happening. The question is, will Shari Redstone, who controls mm -hmm. National Amusements, which is a holding company for Paramount, does she want to sell? She is yeah. consistently said or expressed or even by her moves here in the industry that she believes Paramount's worth a lot more than what the offers are. Yeah. But she seems like she's not point. willing to let go of this emotional connection that she has yeah. to the brand. Mm -hmm. But on the consumer side of things, turning now to Walmart, the retailer planning to build or convert more than 150 stores. Now, this will be over the course of the next five years. Meanwhile, during the 12 months, Walmart also plans to remodel 650 stores. Now, that's across 47 states and Puerto Rico. But in this, in this move, this latest 150 stores will grow the current store base by roughly 3%. And so they're making quite an investment here. But also important to note here that this comes on the heels of them closing roughly one 140 stores since fiscal year 2020. And so when you think about that in mind, the share, the the market share gain that Walmart has had in recent months, they're really trying to entice consumers to come into their doors and trying to hold on to that share that they've gained recently, given consumers going there for groceries primarily. You know, I didn't know that they were actually going to just kind of shift close some stores, mm. open new ones, convert other other small stores to bigger stores. It just sort of my initial thought was that this is them kind of doubling down on physical retail. Yeah. The importance yeah. of that and going having a one big tent for everything, but yeah. it's interesting you note that the closures kind of coincide with this additions as well. Yeah, and, and you bring up a good point too, like doubling down on brick and mortar at a time when we're seeing e-commerce really mm -hmm. balloon there. But you know, Walmarts they've been making some they've been making some moves, right? Some Even with moves. the uh, their raise the minimum wage, right, Correct. for their managers. They just recently announced a twenty thousand dollar stock grant for super center US store managers. They also recently announced less than that ten thousand for more of a smaller typical store. But this is going to be the first super store. Um, they haven't opened a new superstore in roughly two years. So that really goes to show the gizmets and gasmos that they're trying to show off here, this remodeled look as they try to hold on to that high income share shoppers. Right, store of the future, right? So store of the future, yeah. Pross. Store of the future. And we're heading into the future as well because coming mm -hmm. up, we'll get you set for everything you need to know to start your day tomorrow. More Yahoo Finance after this.
Time now for what to watch Thursday, February 1st. Three more Magnificent Seven companies reporting earnings, capping off a huge week for tech earnings. Apple, Amazon, and Meta all reporting tomorrow after closing bell. For Apple, investors will be watching the China business, especially as the company has underperformed to start the year. The advertising business, meanwhile, will be key for Meta, and it comes after the miss on Google's ad revenue on Tuesday. As for Amazon, Wall Street will be watching the cloud business, AWS. We're going to have full coverage and analysis of the results. Turning to the economy, we'll get readings on weekly initial jobless claims, which come ahead of the January jobs report on Friday. We'll also get a reading on the manufacturing sector, the ISM index, out in the morning, and it's expected to decline slightly from December. And moving to the housing market, new mortgage rate data coming out in the afternoon. Rates of seesaw the last couple weeks going up last week about a tenth of 1%. And as we look ahead to the rest of the week, another huge piece of economic data, the January jobs report. It comes after ADP's private payroll data shows switching jobs is not paying off in the way it used to, and pay benefits from the great resignation are becoming a thing of the past. Our Josh Schaefer has been looking at that data in the ADP report. So interesting. Normalization. Takeaways. Julie, I think is our mm, is word here. And I, I think that's going to keep being our word for the labor market as a whole when we talk about are we softening, are we cooling, is the labor market coming into a downturn as we have these rates high for this long. I think it's important to point out right now, economists and to some extent Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell today talking about the labor market, really talking more about we're coming back to normal to where we were pre-pandemic. And I think that's something you see from ADP's chart that was out today when you take a look at wage growth for job changers and job stayers. Your purple line there is people that leave their job for a new job, and your blue line is just for wage growth at someone that stays in their job. You can see that big spread that we had there in 2022 when we were getting a lot of crazy incentives for people to leave their job, and it, it felt like people that were leaving a job were instantly getting another job, and there were countless stories about things like that. Now we're back to the, the percentage point spread that we're seeing between those two lines is 1.9%, and that is a pre-pandemic level. So we're back to sort of, of course, I think a lot of people know when you leave your job, you often do get a little bit more of a pay raise than you'd probably see in your current job, but not anything atypical. And I think that's probably sort of a welcome sign for the Fed in terms of wage growth and potential inflation implications. Yeah, you were talking a piece too about how that decrease in wage growth, just speaking of the Fed, I mean, that's welcome news to Jay Powell and oh, his gang. It, it definitely yeah. is. And the other wage growth data that we had out today was the employment cost index, right? And we saw that quarter over quarter increasing less than 1%. That was the first time ECI has in, uh, increased less than 1% on a quarterly basis for nearly two and a half years. So that is an ideal scenario for the Fed because, of course, the take being if we were to keep making all this money and perhaps maybe making too much money, we might be willing to pay higher prices. So it seems like for now, that's sort of coming into favor for the Fed and falling in the right direction. If only there were a way for us all to make more money and not pay higher prices. That's the ideal, right? <laughs> that's the real soft landing, Julia. That's really the ideal is. scenario for us. For all that. right, Josh Schaefer, <laughs> thanks so much. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a great night.